Good morning, everyone um, watching on Zoom and on Facebook Live. This is the second day of our uh, roundtable on populism and minorities uh, that we are hosting from uh, the Center for the Study of Developing Societies here in New Delhi. I'm Ananya Vajpayee. Um, I'm the convener and, and, and chair of, of, of this two-day roundtable. Um, I already introduced uh, the entire concept and, uh, and, and, and the various elements yesterday, uh, but I'll quickly recap today for those who are joining for the first time. Um, we are essentially celebrating um, and putting into conversation with one another uh, five new books. Uh, on on uh, broadly on these three related themes of populism, minorities, and majoritarianism. Um, all speakers uh, over these two days are are either editors of these books, contributors to these books, writers of these books, uh, and um, the the number in fact is very large. But we've been able to uh, get together uh, about eight or ten of us uh, across these five volumes, um, and we are uh, all in discussion uh, on these broad thematics. Um, I want to further add that uh, we are looking uh, primarily for the purposes of this round table at South Asia and particularly at India, um, but in the broader spectrum of, of, of the books, uh, you will also find um, um, some coverage uh, of other democracies uh, where these phenomena uh, are pertinent, uh, especially in Europe, uh, in the Anglo-American world. Um, and uh, also in other countries in, in South Asia, uh, including Pakistan. So, um, so uh, this round table is, is, is more indicative than, and, than comprehensive, uh, but we did want to uh, essentially uh, span the entire range of the humanities and social sciences, um, um, which are represented in these five volumes. Um, the disciplines that we, we cover uh, between us um, include political science, both conceptual and empirical, um, political theory, literary theory, intellectual history, political philosophy, comparative politics, political sociology, political psychology. Um, and uh, it is through all these different lenses uh, across these five books that a number of scholars uh, from, uh, from South Asia and from different parts of the world uh, bring to bear um, their research, uh, their analysis, and their uh, commentary uh, on populism and minorities. Um, so uh, we've already, uh, yesterday, we've, we've had uh, uh, several speakers. Um, including um, Prashanta Chakravarti, uh, who is at Delhi University. Uh, we've had Hilal Ahmed, who is here at CSDS. We've had uh, Ishwaran Sridharan, uh, who is at uh, the Center for Advanced Study of India of the University of Pennsylvania. Um, we've had um, Mujibur Rahman, who is at Jamia Millia University. And finally, to close uh, yesterday's uh, session, we had uh, Professor Christophe Jaffrelo, uh, who's at CNRS in Paris, as well as at King's College in London. Um, now, today, I'm going to start off by actually uh, discussing my um, piece in, 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 this, in this conversation. Uh, and, and I won't be able to read out my entire chapter in the volume that I have edited together with my colleague from Rome, Volker Kaul, who will be closing the conference today, uh, later in the afternoon. Um, uh, the, there isn't time for me to present uh, my entire uh, chapter, uh, but I'll just try to put across a few of the main ideas that I have tried to develop. Uh, in my uh, work here. Um, I should say that those of you who tuned in yesterday um, uh, will find that there is some overlap with the paper that uh, Professor Jaffrelo uh, presented. And this is serendipitous. Um, um, we, uh, you know, I don't think we were necessarily uh, aware in advance that, that this would happen. Um, but um, there, there you will see similarities and resonances there. Um, and of course, um, you know, you, 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 you can put these things together and, and, and the discussion can be even more rich. Um, so um, I'm not going to 
speak today about minorities. Um, we, we did that quite extensively yesterday uh, through the various other papers. Um, I only do want to say uh, as a general remark, uh, which is pertinent to the entire round table, that um, we've been uh, focusing a lot on the category of a minority um, as a conceptual category, as a, as a real world uh, political category, um, uh, as, as a constitutional category. Um, and in particular, we've been looking at Muslims as a minority, uh, both in India as well as in uh, various uh, countries in uh, Western Europe where there are large Muslim immigrant communities. Um, and um, this, th this has tended to be a, 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 a broad focus um, um, and, and, and it brings forth the different meanings of, 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 of what a minority is uh, in a given political context, in a given uh, cultural, uh, uh, historical region of the world uh, where uh, the histories of, the, of, 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 of how there are Muslim communities and populations are very, very different. Um, in any case, um, my uh, chapter, which I'm going to share just now um, uh, for the next uh, 15 minutes or so, um, is actually um, about um, the personality of the authoritarian populist leader uh, and, um, you know, what we can understand about the particular kind of relationship that such a leader will evolve uh, with the populace, with the public, with his constituency or her constituency, um, um, that actually um, makes, um, makes this leader so popular uh, and, and makes it possible for such a leader to uh, assert his authority or her authority uh, in a way that, that uh, you know, allows us to call him or her uh, a strong man. Um, so in my case, I have actually uh, looked at uh, the Indian uh, Prime Minister, uh, Narendra Modi, who has been Prime Minister of India since 2014. Um, my analysis actually, uh, because of the time at which this book went to press, um, uh, our book on, on, on minorities and populism, Critical Perspectives from South Asia and Europe, co-edited by me and by Volker Kohl. This book went to press um, uh, uh, at a time when we, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I haven't been able to uh, reflect on or take into account developments uh, of last year since the pandemic. Uh, the book, in fact, came out in spring 2020, exactly when when the pandemic hit uh, India. So subsequent developments are not are not reflected in my analysis. Um, so um, my um, submission is that, and, and this is based on, um, on studying um, the, the personality as well as the, the politics uh, of, of, uh, of Mr. Modi, uh, both when he was Gujarat chief minister uh, for many years and then subsequently as prime minister, as well as as leader of the BJP, the Bharatiya Janta Party. Um, uh, so I start off by, by, of course, acknowledging that he's not the first populist or popular um, a mass leader uh, that modern India has produced, both in the period immediately before um, uh, decolonization and independence and in the post-colonial period. Um, the most uh, exa uh, sort of uh, common uh, comparison uh, that is made is between uh, Mr. Modi and, and uh, former Prime Minister uh, Indira Gandhi. Um, and uh, they shared many features uh, of, of their uh, rulership style, their leadership style, their oratorial uh, command, uh, as well as their immense popularity over a very long period of time uh, with a very large number of, of voters uh, and Indian citizens, um, many times uh, in direct contradiction with, with uh, their political, economic, etc. performance. Um, uh, so this is something that other scholars have, have looked at in some detail, especially comparing um, uh, Mrs. Gandhi's um, uh, sort of most authoritarian moments, perhaps uh, during um, the, the, the creation of Bangladesh uh, in 1971, 
um, the testing of uh, the, the India's first nuclear weapon in, in, in 1974, uh, the imposition of the emergency in, in, the, in the mid late 70s, um, and uh, her final act of, um, of uh, trying to crush the militancy in Punjab in 1984, which culminated in her assassination. Um, so uh, at these moments, we see uh, a, a strong resonance in the style of leadership of, of, uh, of, of Mrs. Gandhi and Mr. Modi. Um, <clears throat> but I wanted to uh, point out the kind of uh, new, um, uh, you know, what, what, what is new in, 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 in Mr. Modi's uh, populist appeal and his populist um, uh, persona. Um, the first uh, is, is, is um, a Janus face message, I call it, where he simultaneously speaks uh, in two different voices uh, and, 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 and addresses through those two voices, two different and sometimes uh, overlapping constituencies, but sometimes also uh, different constituencies. Uh, through one mouth, as it were, he speaks the language of economic nationalism and through the other mouth, he speaks the language of religious nationalism. And these are both combined, uh, but uh, they are having a differential impact on different segments of, of, of his voters. Um, secondly, uh, I point to uh, his expert deployment um, of, of print, electronic, and social media, as well as the use of public relations and event management on an unprecedented scale. Um, I mean, some of the, the newness here has to do with the availability of new technologies and new uh, media, um, a new media environment, uh, which was which was not in existence, uh, you know, 40, 50 years ago, uh, uh, when Mrs. Gandhi was in power. Um, but he really uses uh, media um, uh, and, and the media machinery in a, in a very, very effective manner. Um, to communicate with voters and citizens on a continuous basis. Um, in addition, there uh, this, this media deployment uh, and media um, capture, in a sense, uh, media monopoly, uh, is also um, uh, extended. It's its effectiveness is extended through the capture of a number of other institutions. Um, uh, you can um, give the example currently of the election commission. Um, you can even give the example of the Supreme Court. Um, uh, uh, the independence not only of the press and the electronic media and social media um, and of, uh, of, 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 of the film industry, for example, not only have these been uh, co-opted uh, towards uh, use by uh, the, the incumbent uh, regime, uh, but a number of other institutions that mediate between uh, the population and 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 uh, the rulership, uh, these two have uh, in effect been captured uh, for uh, to 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 perform a service uh, or more on behalf of 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 uh, of the powers that be rather than uh, representing a diversity of opinion uh, uh, across the country. So third, there is a crafting of a public persona for, for Mr. Modi himself, which has been very careful, very deliberate, and very, very effective. Um, he uh, has always projected himself as a singular leader in many senses, um, and he rises above his party. He rises above the Sangh Parivar. He rises above his state of Gujarat. And he rises indeed uh, above the entire ideological camp of the Hindu right uh, to present himself uh, as a, um, uh, a kind of singular figure who, in, in, you know, without without any of these crutches, without any of these stages of mediation, actually represents in himself um, uh, the will of the people and the opinion of the people um, and their interests. Um, and um, this has actually um, you know, uh, been achieved through a very systematic sidelining of the party apparatus, of the RSS apparatus, um, you know, of his cabinet, uh, of parliament itself, um, of, of various specific vote banks, um, uh, electoral processes, um, uh, and representative government, 
bypassing all of this, offering himself the singular protagonist uh, as the voice, the will, and the image of the Indian people. Um, further, I say that he uses at least um, um, four platforms for relentless self-projection and uh, uh, as the singular icon rising above the political fray. Um, uh, the first is, of course, the domestic election campaign. Um, in a sense, he is uh, the most visible, the most prominent, and the most popular campaigner uh, of any party, uh, of any persuasion, in any part of the country, in any state or national election. Um, um, he is nothing if not a successful campaigner, both for himself as well as for the BJP. The second um, uh, platform, in a sense, uh, and this is especially true in his first uh, administration, 2014 to 2019, um, is the visit to the foreign country. So at the time that this book made to, went to press, he had already made 41 such trips um, uh, to, to 60 countries. Uh, and this uh, immediately globalizes his reach. Uh, it's a global platform. Uh, you know, uh, every 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 few days or weeks, he would be in a different country. Uh, many of them, um, you know, uh, visited uh, very rarely by Indian leaders of the past, um, and and this became a sort of uh, a new uh, space where he could uh, project himself as being a certain kind of leader, a certain kind of Indian. Um, the third platform is his Twitter handle. Um, uh, at Narendra Modi, which has close to, at that time of the book going to press, uh, 48 million followers, which, which may be a larger number today, I don't know. Um, and finally, he has instituted, uh, and this is something Professor Jafralo spoke about yesterday, this very successful uh, radio broadcast, uh, very regular, called Man Ki Baat, uh, which of course means, you know, the discourse of his heart really sharing with the people what is on his mind and in his heart and a direct unmediated broadcast, uh, you know, which again bypasses all of the usual modalities and channels of uh, communication between a democratic representative leadership and a diverse uh, uh, population. So across these four kinds of stages or spaces, all heavily reliant on electronic and social media, he is able to create a persona for himself that he then projects directly to Indians at home and abroad, wherein the connection of the citizen or the consumer or the convert is always with Narendra Modi, the man and the leader. And it bypasses the entire set of institutional relationships that together constitute the structure of Indian democracy and indeed the architecture of the government uh, of India. His leadership uh, tactics, in fact, follow those successful, uh, uh, you know, brands uh, uh, that you see in, in, in corporate culture, which is why I, I use the word consumer and citizen uh, advisedly. Um, uh, and, 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 and this phenomenon of personal and highly mediatized branding uh, is something new uh, in the context of Indian politics. Um, um, you know, it's, it's, and it's a very deliberate strategy. I should say that uh, after the pandemic began, especially in the year of the lockdown, um, the image uh, of, of Mr. Modi has become even more distinctive uh, with the long beard, uh, with with the more kind of uh, ascetic and uh, guru like and uh, elderly and otherworldly uh, sort of um, um, you know rising above politics rising above uh, the public health emergency above the fray of economic distress um, and really speaking you know with the wisdom of the ages uh, that is very much also symbolized in his personal appearance and the way it has been uh, dramatically altered. Uh, uh, in just in the course of the past year of the of the uh, uh, of the of the pandemic, um, and in on the radio program, especially, he has long assumed this avuncular tone, um, um, like an elder in the family, speaking uh, mostly in banal generalities and formulaic platitudes. Uh, the closest he comes to actually being prime ministerial, rather than. Uh, 
partisan and and being sociable rather than strategic because in his election speeches um, and in his uh, political speeches he tends to be um, uh, rather um, um, uh, rather pointed uh, especially in in the way in which he often directly uh, attacks uh, political opponents um so the particular sort of mixed message that he has concocted from these different modes of communication seems to work well in keeping him consistently popular uh, with his voters and supporters um now uh, i just i have to close because we are running out of time um but i want to say that that what actually makes this uh, all of this work you know many many leaders across the world past and present um to varying degrees liberal illiberal authoritarian um um of left and right persuasions of all kinds of different political leanings uh have used a combination of media management uh propaganda um self uh, you know the 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 crafting of a very peculiar and particular self image uh, uh which is personal uh and which appeals to people for a variety of reasons um all of this is 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 not unfamiliar in uh, especially in in this world of strong men strong women and populism um that that uh, you know we are living in in the, in the in the early part of the 21st century um but uh i just wanted to close by saying that uh perhaps what what makes this very uh effective uh and when the process which is actually occurring here you know it's not it's not simply that you put out a message and that message takes um you know uh, we we are familiar with other politicians in in the indian case who are um uh, unable to uh, to captivate the people with their messaging um uh, and despite uh, perhaps uh, very vast resources uh, very uh, large parties at their uh, available for them at their disposal um what works is that in a sense the populist leader like mr modi um is a blank surface effectively he acts as a mirror uh, to the people and he shows them in his words in his speech uh, what they then come to believe has been their unarticulated implicit uh, politics um uh and this is something which is which is very very insidious because you know you could argue that this is actually uh, a created uh uh set of 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 views and beliefs uh and that these are very deliberately planted uh and that these are then projected uh but the impression that people have is that when they hear this populist leader speak he is actually talking to them in their own language and telling them what in a sense they already know but reinforcing it and presenting it as their the distillation of their collective and their genuine will uh, which which he is able to best um, uh, represent and to best encapsulate uh, and also then to realize uh, as a political vision so if india is moving towards or has already moved significantly towards the right um if it has if it has uh, reemerged uh, as a majoritarian um sort of uh, uh crypto hindu rashtra uh, whatever may be the the you know um basic principles uh, enshrined in the constitution and so on uh, and whatever may be our post colonial history if we are indeed effectively morphing into a, a hindu rashtra um then um mr modi's uh, achievement i think is to <clears throat> uh, make it seem that that is where uh, we were always already headed and that is what the greater majority of india's population uh, which is 80% hindu um uh, it, it wanted so he is merely reflecting back to them what they had always already wanted from the time of uh, of of independence um when things didn't turn out uh, in that way um and so um this 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 kind of janus faced character who is also a singular protagonist who is also in a sense an empty signifier that can be filled with a variety of meanings which are then um suggested as being mere reflections of the popular will 
um, this is what uh, makes uh, makes this leadership so very effective. Um, and we need to understand and um, uh, detail um, the the processes that are at work. Uh, we need to we we need to be able to make a sense of them um, rather than merely reacting to them or or questioning them uh, or failing indeed to understand uh, why uh, let's say opposition leaders are not able to um, sort of replicate this playbook um, and also to understand what happens in the future uh, if if this uh, you know if this continues um, uh, and it continues to work in a sense um, for uh, the very very large um, uh, electorate uh, of Indian democracy. So I'll just stop there. Um, and if anybody has any questions uh, among the panelists, uh, please just uh, you know come on the screen, uh, open your camera and your your uh, your uh, mic and and ask me. Uh, if anybody else has questions that you'd like to uh, pose, please uh, uh, type them into the Q and A section or the chat section, uh, so that I can uh, read them out and then try to answer them. Uh, and if if there's nothing further to be said, then we'll just move on to our next speaker. Yes, Peter, please yeah, go I ahead. Have, yeah, thank you very much for, for that very clear and cogent uh, presentation. Uh, I want to continue yesterday's discussion from from your from your uh, description of the populist leader. I, ha I have two questions. One is. Would you consider Angela Merkel a populist leader? Because she meets many of the conditions. She has huge popularity. Uh, people people repose faith in her. Uh, she's uh, able to communicate directly to them. They, they you know, in, in moments of crisis, they feel yeah, that- Yeah, Merkel, you said? She's a steady hand. Uh, yeah, Angela Merkel. Okay. Uh, so, so many of the conditions that you've identified, I would see, uh, with Angela Merkel, but you wouldn't call her a populist leader. Well, <laughs> so so either or the yeah, that's that's my first question. My second question is uh, the, the the blank the blank mirror or the the blank sheet that you identified as a defining characteristic. I don't think that's quite right. I think the the populist leader who I prefer to use the word demagogue actually makes actually makes uh perception doesn't uh, doesn't reflect perception makes perception and that perception is 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 uh, uh, you know is provided in moments of confusion and uncertainty uh, so so it's not it's not a blank it's not that people have a perception which which then gets reflected on the leader and they begin to see he's speaking in their language he makes them he he, he gives coherence to confusion he gives coherence to anxiety, he or she. So, so I, I, these are just two inconvenient uh, uh, responses to, to uh, yeah. a very enjoyable presentation. Right. Um, so on, on the question of Angela Merkel, see, I, I, I am absolutely in agreement with you that uh, populist leaders uh, are not necessarily of one or other ideological camp. I mean, that is not a way to identify a, a populist leader. Um, but whether she qualifies as a strong man, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not so certain. Uh, for, for example, she's announced that, you know, this is her last uh, run in office and she's not going to contest uh, any further elections, even though this jeopardizes her party's future. Uh, because there's not such a clear line of succession uh, within her party, and and this could completely upend, uh, you know, the the kind of consensus uh, which is currently prevailing in in German politics, uh, and and also jeopardize the potential for leadership of the EU, which uh, which the German uh, uh, Germans have had for for quite a while, especially under her leadership. So um, so in that sense, I think she's. She's not aiming to be, uh, you know, the kind of uh, permanent, perpetual leader that that many populists uh, seek to be. I think she's she's still, uh, you know, keeping within the bounds of of uh, you know democratic re-election 
um, you know, going back to the people for a genuine mandate, trying to understand uh, how, to what extent, you know, she, she continues to represent, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the Germans. Uh, all of that, I, I think, undercuts uh, an idea that, I mean, she may be very popular. She may also be very strong in her, you know, leadership. But that those two things are quite distinct, I think, and I'm. I, you, we can we can discuss this later if you would like. Um, um, you know, then 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 actually qualifying as a true populist or a true demagogue. Um, I think I think that's that's a kind of rough and ready uh, answer I would have. Um, I agree with you that the the populist, especially in Mr. Modi's case. Um, creates and doesn't merely reflect, um, uh, you know, political opinion, political will, political consciousness, and so on. Um, but, the, but the impression given is that he is speaking back to the people and echoing them or reflecting them like a mirror. Now, this is something that uh, Professor Jafarlo touched on yesterday, right? That, um, you know, in a sense, the real problem uh, in many democracies is how the mass of people, uh, you know, need to need to bypass the elites, right? And it is in setting aside the elites and in in, in connecting directly with this, uh, you know, real or imagined, constructed or projected uh, people that the populist finds uh, his niche and his forte. Um, so I think the, you know, in many ways. I mean, you, and you can see this most strongly in the discussion on secularism in India, right, which is currently, uh, you know, almost exhausted, that, um, you know, uh, the BJP and under Modi has managed to somehow uh, make it seem as though there is an inevitability of Hindutva, uh, and that that is the genuine direction in which India has been moving throughout the 20th century, despite the Nehruvian interregnum, despite uh, partition, you know, despite the assassination of Mahatma Gandhi, despite the constitution, and despite, you know, 40, 50, 60 years of Congress rule. Uh, nevertheless, it was always already a script that was inevitable and fated you know, that we would become a Hindu nation, right? Now, it, he has made it seem like this was always the case and that this is what people really want, which he is merely now providing to them what they really want. But you are absolutely right that it's not at all clear and it's highly, highly debatable whether this was, you know, where we thought we would end up uh, you know, 72, uh, 70 years ago. So um, I, I think I think you're right. I mean, we have to take the mirror effect as an effect, but a, 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 a you know a, a slate of hand, a thom toy, uh, which which perhaps conceals uh, a much more powerful uh, projection uh, and planting of certain ideas and views out there. Uh, in, 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 in this, uh, you know, in a sense, vulnerable population. And I have a little analysis in my article of uh, actually how it's Nehru, you know, who first uh, in the discovery of India, where he describes one of his early election campaigns in, in the late 30s, he says, you know, how do you connect with the people? There's this, there's this eye contact you know, directly between himself standing up on a stage and these hundreds of people, thousands of people that he addresses in his public rallies. Uh, and, and then he says, you know, he has, a, he has this vision of Bharat Mata uh, and he has this direct, uh, you know, these millions of hands are raised, these millions of eyes are looking into his eyes, uh, you know, and he gives a very strong set of visual metaphors for what is occurring, the alchemy between um, you know, the, 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 the exchange of uh, a political vision between the leader and the people. And this is so much better, uh, you know, produced and, 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 and augmented by new technologies of, of audiovisual and media, media, mediatized communication, which works to Mr. Modi's advantage. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to stop there because I can't, 
you know take um, take uh, more time in the next speaker's uh, turn uh, but thank you uh, and we'll just move on now to our next session uh, sorry our next our next speaker in this session thanks peter for your question so our um, our next uh, uh, speaker today is um, is uh, professor uh, dr ajay gudagwarthi who is um, a political scientist he is at the center for political studies uh, in the school of social sciences at the jawaharlal nehru university uh, and he is also uh, published one of the books that we are uh, discussing and 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 uh, celebrating today uh, india after modi populism and the right uh, which came out from bloomsbury actually it was probably the first of our 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 four or five volumes uh, back in 2018 um and uh, today uh, ajay is going to be speaking about um, <clears throat> populist possibilities uh, i think he deliberately left it somewhat uh, open so we'll find out what uh, what he's going to tell us about please ajay go ahead okay <clears throat> and we are and, uh, uh, just just for the record we are uh, sort of 15 minutes off schedule at this point uh, but it's okay we can we can leak into the into the sort of lunch hour so uh, you'll have your full time don't worry about that okay <clears throat> so uh, thanks anandya for <clears throat> putting this together i think uh, there were some exhaustive uh, uh, discussion yesterday so what uh, i wish to really do is to kind of uh, build on uh, what uh, kind of argued in my book on uh, populism where i have uh, <clears throat> kind of hinted that uh, populism also produces its own kinds of uh, possibilities it's not all about a dark uh, history and it's not all about producing authoritarian uh, uh, figures uh, while all that happens and we have been uh, deliberating on that Uh, i am only trying to look at uh, the possibility whether uh, populism has its own kind of a double movement and it kind of produces its own other and uh, there is a possibility of uh, uh, kind of uh, recalibrating uh, social imaginary uh, imaginary uh, and there are new possibilities that one uh, should seize upon and one should i think deliberate upon along with the kind of critique uh, that we have been uh, offering and uh, in that i'll just throw up a few uh, issues that have been thinking through and uh, kind of formulating the uh, pretty tentative at the movement uh, but uh, trying to kind of formulate as to what kind of a uh, uh, new uh, reconfiguration that uh, populism might uh, throw up uh, that uh, this kind of a uh, uh, i mean the many things uh, this kind of a kind of uh, what we have been discussing Uh, a kind of a new transparency that uh, populism demands. Uh, there are new kind of social and political spaces it is uh, producing, uh, and therefore uh, my hunch would be that perhaps we have to also read uh, populism in terms of the possibilities it creates. Uh, read against the grain to see that <clears throat> a, a new kind of a, a recalibration of a social and political imagination could be a distinct uh, possibility as one of the possible. Uh, outcomes that is on populist possibilities that uh, one of the possible outcomes uh, uh, out of uh, this kind of a uh, majoritarian uh, cultural majoritarian imagination so i'll kind of throw up a flag of few of the things that i've been thinking about one is in terms of the nature of uh, protest uh, that uh, populism has also witnessed in the last few years particularly uh, i think uh, it has thrown up uh, a range of uh, protest movements and i was wondering what one could perhaps gain in terms of uh, comparing uh, these uh, uh, pop, uh, protest politics uh, within this as a response to the uh, populist authoritarianism uh, i have attempted to compare the anti ca uh, politics with that of the recent farmers uh, protest movement to kind of understand what do these uh, uh, protest movements really uh, signify and uh, what are they being nudged towards uh, in terms of their response Uh, to a kind of a, a popular politics that has been initiated outside uh, uh, you know, uh, high politics, outside institutional, legal uh, a kind of a focus that constitutional democracies generally have. In terms of popular politics, uh, these protest movements 
and there i found that uh, uh, my recent reading upon uh, uh, cultural sociology uh, framework of uh, jeffrey alexander in terms of uh, uh, understanding the role of performance very broadly makes this point that modern society there is something pre modern and modern one can make that kind of a distinction but uh, he argues that modern societies are marked by uh, increasing and proliferating kind of social differentiation where uh, uh, any kind of shared meaning becomes an extremely complex uh, process that uh, people have a differentiated kind of uh, interpretation uh, owing to the uh, growing social lateral social uh, differentiation and that's where he brings in the role of performance uh, becomes extremely important in uh, communicating uh, with each other in terms of collective social groups uh, uh, for that he suggests certain methods of occupying uh, uh, and signifying and resignifying cultural codes by cultural codes he broadly uh, alludes to uh, historical memory uh, myths that exist in society popular symbolism that exists in society uh, and therefore by resignifying this popular culture he suggests that uh, a shared meanings are possible and in that uh, in his own book on civil sphere uh, uh, jeff in fact uh, studies the civil rights movement and uh, martin luther king's work that started in the south uh, in the united states and generated a kind of a performance around martyrdom suffering uh, religious symbolism uh, to create what he refers to an identification uh, with the white uh, in the north uh, i was only wondering that this i think uh, uh, gives us some clues in terms of how uh, farmer movement kind of succeeded uh, <clears throat> in producing a certain kind of a symbolic uh, presentation in the way they framed uh, their social demands uh, i think for the first time uh, the right wing uh, populist hegemony uh, got seriously kind of challenged uh, under the current uh, regime and if you look at the movement closely now uh, after the first phase in the second phase uh, they are actually expanding in terms of accommodating uh, dalit question uh, they are having panchayats that are discussing uh, the internal caste prejudices uh, within the uh, farming community they have created a new space for women uh, uh, they have invited muslim leaders to their uh, mahapanchayat and they deliberated upon the role of uh, especially the jat uh, community in the riots that took place in muzaffarnagar it's almost like the truth and reconciliation kind of a performance of uh, south africa that one could see uh, where uh, uh the uh, many of these leaders have openly acknowledged uh, their role in kind of um, uh, writing and the kind of prejudices that existed against uh, they have moved closer to left uh, unions uh, they have openly come in support of the uh, political prisoners bima koregaon i think all this signifies something very very uh, distinct and very uh, uh, i think one one it take these moves very seriously in terms of how a new kind of a normative universal is being created Uh, by the farmers movement and i think populism uh, and authoritarian populism that has been kind of breathing down uh, and uh, kind of closing down spaces has created a need to kind of internally introspect uh, you no know, differences and uh, this obviously this is a movement led by rich peasantry which has been part of the dominant proprietary classes and ruling bloc uh, but you can see that there is a new kind of a equivalence being created between uh, different uh, social uh, groups and they have succeeded in communicating to society at large uh, a certain kind of moral valency through the kind of symbols of anna data uh, you know in terms of security nationalism so on and so forth and i was only wondering uh, what should this tell us about uh, does it have any significant clues in terms of how we can think of minority uh, politics how we can uh, kind of think in terms of how uh, symbolism of uh, minority politics could kind of draw on these uh, especially the anti ca movement that kind of began uh, uh, with uh, with a kind of a composite group uh, over a period uh, has got reduced to as a movement by muslims and for muslim uh, citizenship and they it got kind of reduced to a kind of singularity that majority then gays would like to fix on it uh, uh, and therefore uh, 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 what kind of symbolism uh, can minority politics really produce uh, uh, in india in terms of creating uh, what uh, just refers to as shade meaning uh, uh, 
of course, this kind of framing often, I mean, in other public talks when I've referred to, often the critique uh, is that this is quite an assimilationist uh, kind of an argument. This is this kind of uh, reeks of patronage, uh, this kind of burdens, already vulnerable minorities to produce. Uh, I think it's time we kind of revisit this kind of framing of all shared engagement through the language of patronage and all uh, ideas of solidarity are construed uh, to be hegemonic. I think populist authoritarianism is really creating uh, that social condition to kind of reframe uh, these questions beyond the old uh, kind of secular associational uh, frame, which often hints us towards, uh, I think, uh, excessively to think in terms of patronage and uh, hegemony uh, as against shared meanings and uh, solidarity. Similarly, uh, uh, I've argued in some, some, of, some of my recent uh, pieces that uh, I think there is also a process alongside the authoritarianism, alongside uh, majoritarianism, that there is also perhaps a process uh, that populists have initiated in order to maintain uh, that social hegemony, uh, what I would refer to as democratization by default. That there are various spaces one could look at as to how uh, this use of this kind of a muscular way of wedging open uh, various kinds of social uh, questions that kind of got interlocked for a very long time uh, in Indian public discourse uh, through uh, the, I think, the language of secularism, the way secularism played out in the post-independence period. One such question, obviously, is the uh, question of minority rights versus gender rights. That kind of got logged for way too long, and we saw the consequence of that in terms of Chabani. Uh, personal laws, things of that kind. I think there might be a way now, uh, 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 the kind of populist, the way they are uh, forcing upon the gender question into the uh, reading into the minority politics through the debate on triple talaq, through the question of gender, uh, gender justice, so on and so forth. Uh, uh, it kind of, I think also a part of that response we already saw in terms of women leading the anti-CA protests and occupying the public space, perhaps for the first time in the way they have done in the post-independence period, uh, which uh, then opens up uh, a question like what I think uh, I recollect Partha Chatterjee, uh, you know, in the rejoinder that he wrote, uh, uh, the volume my editor on political society, he makes this very intriguing point that what happens to the political subject uh, when they retreat from the street, you know, when they, uh, when they go back to the uh, private spaces of their homes, uh, do they remain a political subject? I think this is a question that uh, that Chatterjee formulator, I think, is extremely important in this uh, context of the anti-CA movement. I think it would do us good in terms of looking at what would happen uh, to these uh, women uh, who are participating in the anti-CA movement when they go back to the private spaces. How do they kind of renegotiate the public private distinction, uh, what difference would it internally make to the way minority politics has uh, kind of uh, panned out panned out in uh, post-independence uh, period. Uh, and, and therefore, I think it also raises this whole uh, question of uh, uh, the uh, kind of question that we have been debating when yesterday, I think it came up again and again in terms of this homogeneous projection of uh, Muslims. Uh, uh, as against internal differentiation and uh, heterogeneity. Uh, so that this, how, how is it this going to change uh, the projection of uh, Muslims as this unified, aggressive, uh, no masculine kind of uh, identification that often happens, uh, especially under the current uh, populist regime, uh, I think would open up new spaces. What those could be, I think is something that uh, we could kind of uh, collectively uh, deliberate upon. Similarly, on the caste front, I think uh, the way uh, uh, the electoral uh, strategy of the BJP has kind of uh, spent the last five, six years, uh, while uh, uh, I have noted this again long back that there is a kind of a rightward shift of the Dalit and OBC uh, towards uh, BJP. Uh, but this remains an open question as to are they being really part of the larger uh, Hindutva agenda? Uh, uh, is it does it only signify uh, polarization? Is this shift happening because of uh, a certain kind of communalization of subaltern caste? Uh, while all those trends, I think, to an extent, are visible, uh, one need not kind of uh, draw away from them. But at the same time, there is also something else happening in terms of the reason as to why 
uh, these groups are moving increasingly towards right is also the uh, in course of the electoral strategy uh, again i think uh, the the right is wedging open the question of uh, smaller jati smaller subcast and their representation within the dalit and within the obc pulling them out from the uh, hegemonic hold of the dominant caste the more relatively more powerful caste like the yadavs within obc in the jatas within the dalit and this uh, as of now obviously it's leading uh, to kind of a, it is read as a kind of a social fragmentation uh, and uh, and i think the way the right uh, visualizes it is obviously it is visualizing it in terms of weakening uh, the dalit bahujan counter public Uh, the weakening the resistance against uh, monolithic uh, order or so on and so forth uh, which might be partly true but at the same time i think one can also look at uh, uh, one has to also understand how uh, this uh, fragmentation and pulling away of the caste group uh, from the hold of internal hegemony within dalits and obc a uh, loosening up of those patronage ties uh, uh, what would uh, this uh, signify in terms of emerging uh, counter public Uh, uh this loosening i think already we have a new discourse of dalit muslim unity uh, that has uh, come about uh, there is question of moral relativism i think i'll skip that point it's a, a slightly a complex point i'll not have the time to uh, get into it uh, so i think uh, i think uh, my own hunch would be that we'll have to take this loosening up of caste groups uh, read it beyond uh, merely uh, kind of uh, 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 weakening. What is what is visible as of today is a weakening of uh, Dalit Bahujan resistance and counter public. But it could also uh, turn out that this uh, loosening up of uh, uh, hierarchies within Dalits and OBCs uh, can lead to a new kind of uh, uh, solidarities emerging uh, beyond bounded ident caste identity. Uh, as I said, Dalit Muslim is a new uh, discourse that has really kind of emerged. You know, I mean, it, it is an old discourse, but it's taking a new shape. And part of that. I, uh, uh, as I see it, is emerging out of uh, this loosening of, of uh, internal ties. Third uh, level, I think it's also the regional uh, leadership. I think the way uh, the right wing politics have kind of, uh, in the name of cooperative federalism, have kind of really uh, uh, kind of brought into submission uh, the regional. So one can see the weakening. One uh, reading obviously is the, uh, the the more obvious kind of reading of weakening of federalism. Uh, in india a uh, creation of some kind of a monolithic centralized unitary uh, structure so on and so forth but the other way of reading is uh, that is one watches uh, the uh, regional uh, spaces closely that uh, uh, there is a possibility of uh, this old kind of sons of soil kind of inward movements that we have had uh, that rallied around creation of regional elite that was the strategy of the congress old politics of accommodation of creating regional elites in each of these spaces and those kind of work were held together through the umbrella congress system kind of a model uh, i think bjp strategy is in terms of uh, mobilizing against the entrenched regional satrap uh, undermining their uh, legitimacy uh, I, i mean opening up of the fact that there is a latent anger uh, against the regional elites i think that was clearly visible in kashmir i think they were legitimate in that sense to kind of mobilize uh, of course it's creating a kind of a social vacuum but uh, one one may have to pause and think in terms of how uh, this weakening up of these uh, uh, linguistic regional uh, uh, kind of sons of sons of soil kind of identity that existed uh, uh, what would it lead to what would what is the one what are the other possible possibilities that might emerge out of this kind of a strategy one of the questions that came to my mind would be that uh, are now is it op- is it uh, possible to imagine new spaces for uh, social activism for non electoral politics in fact non party uh, uh, mobilization that uh, that many of you would know very closely uh, is is this opening up of new spaces i think that's already visible in the far north movement which is now kind of spreading out regionally i think a new kind of cross regional uh uh, uh language is emerging uh, as i see on the ground that farmers movement today i've only a couple of days back had a long dialogue with some of them uh, from some of the leaders and some of them organizing they are now going they're part of the campaign in bengal uh, i i think when did we last see that somebody from punjab 
leading the farmers movement go to a campaign against bjp in uh, bengal i think this is something uh, fairly new therefore this we might be moving beyond this idea of local idiom uh, idea of ethnic identities as being authentic uh, local identity uh, because it always had the other side if you remember hiran goas uh, work on assam uh, where he talked about uh, those regional aspirations also being quite chauvinistic uh, quite majoritarian a uh, respected hindu uh, identity so on and so forth i think we might be moving beyond that kind of if i may call it called quote unquote provincial imagination uh, to kind of a new uh, cross regional uh, kind of uh, 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 political formation a uh, new possibility of that kind of a uh, politics uh, seems to be em uh, emerging so i think i'll conclude by arguing that what we might be moving towards is for one is to kind of theorize uh this double movement uh that populist authoritarian is producing in india is a kind of a, a new vision of social uh, democracy a new vision of social democratic politics which one might uh, in fit of things uh, refer to as the third democratic upsurge that we have had uh, following yogen's formulation on second democratic upsurge we could perhaps refer to this as a possibility of a third democratic upsurge that looks beyond bounded caste and religious identities and lays emphasis on cross caste and cross class cross regional and cross religious uh, kind of identities which uh, is allowing us to imagine a new uh, space of civil sphere uh, uh, and which is distinctly post bahujan kind of politics which is also undoubtedly post congress system uh, which might fractify into larger uh, social demands Uh, for universe, for instance, like universal uh, uh, free uh, uh, and quality education for demand that never kind of occupied uh, a caste uh, uh, and even class politics that kind those kind of movements never kind of foregrounded these demands because these belong to uh, nobody. These kind of social demands uh, really did have a social base partly because of the way politics flowed in terms of these uh, bounded identities. but today i see that there is perhaps a possibility with this loosening up of identities happening on multiple fronts that new kinds of uh, social demands might emerge uh, there can be a kind of a reconfiguration of uh, caste based uh, politics uh, i think already we are talking in terms of the nyay scheme basic uh, income scheme uh, so new kind of equivalence uh, is, is i think a distinct possibility that i see and perhaps we are kind of flipping away uh at, at a couple of years back i would have argued that there is an entrenched uh, hindutva hegemony uh, uh, uh which had, had kind of took a concrete shape but follow up events that we have witnessed in couple of years uh, it looks like that we might be moving into what uh, i think gramsci rightly referred to as the period of interregnum i think there is a distinctly non hegemonic uh, space we are now witnessing uh with the new liberalism falling out of favor uh, i think the center model of privatization private global faster growth rate all that i think as a commander it doesn't hold that kind of a, a space in a political imagination as as it did perhaps a decade back uh you know, similarly uh, notions of i think left politics in its old shape uh, i think also have kind of fallen out of favor and hindutva is i think also distinctly is uh, on decline that kind of hegemonic hold that it really had ability to produce a narrative that can speak to a uh, socially differentiated group uh, i think really on the wane and therefore we are entering into a kind of an inter interregnum period of organic crisis where uh, gramsci argues that uh, there's a new kind of a social reconfiguration possible but this as i said is just about one uh, possibility that uh, uh, current Populist authoritarianism might uh, produce. So I'll stop here, Ananya, and thanks again for the opportunity. Um, thank you so much, um, Ajay. Um, I I I agree with you that we are uh, often sort of sidetracked into the dangers of populism, the 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 you know our fear of populism. um bad historical experiences with earlier episodes of populism and uh, perhaps we are failing to see the productive possibilities there uh and the the new formations which are absolutely unprecedented uh and which are genuinely sort of creating new ways in which 
um, there can be uh, a mass expression of 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 uh, political uh, will and political belief and so on. Um, I see that uh, Professor Prashanta Chakravarti has a question. He is. Uh, do you? Yes. Do you yeah. have a question? Okay. So uh, I'll, I'll let him ask it uh, directly. Please go ahead, yes. Prashant. Ajay, uh, thank you. Fantastic presentation. You know, very optimistic, I would say, in this climate. Um, although you call it organic crisis, uh, your presentation is very optimistic. Only one question that I have, your, your article, 18 January in Wire, uh, where you make a very clear distinction between anti-CAA and the farmers' protest, right? There you make, and I, I, I was moved by that article that you know you're uh, you're making that distinction. And today you went further and said, uh, I agree with you. And I, I was hearing others also on this line that the question of mobilization, question of loosening of eternal ties, the way you formulated, it's wonderful. The only thing is that today I found that you are. You know, you, you, are you revisiting your 18th January article where you made a sharp distinction between because that will sound to me that the way you formulated that, that would be populist. What you are telling today, for me, it is popular. The farmers protest to me and the larger way you, you know, the way we look at the Indian uh, formation where it's not exactly left or right, it is, it is popular to me. Whereas the uh, very urban bourgeois approach to protest and you know, internet protest and so on sound to me populist. So uh, my simple question is: Would you like to connect those these uh, the possibilities that you gave us today uh, from the crisis, uh, the urban centric, you know, much more superficial kind of uh, protest? Where you said, you know, it, uh, that question became citizenship of the Muslims. You gave the example of Bilkis Dadi. Hmm. Uh, so that is the point that you know, if I'm if I'm making sense, you know, are you? That, 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 that article was clear division. Today, I, I see that you are trying to bring together anti-CA and the farmers' protest. You are, are you doing, some, doing something to, like that? Are you revising your point? Uh, 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 thanks, Prashant, for that question. No, not really. You know that I'm not, uh, my critique of the anti-CA uh, stand where it is. You know that it is a movement, as I, as I said even today, that it has uh, got reduced to a singularity of identity. And it really stands in contrast to the kind of social demand, uh, kind of a new social imagination that farmers' uh, movement uh, is putting in place. So that I think stands where it is in terms of the overall, uh, uh, no demands of uh, uh, anti-CA uh, protest. Uh, but I'm also arguing that the right is forcing on them this mode of producing this gender question within uh, the anti-CA movement. Uh, uh, so I'm seeing that what kind of a possibility uh, really exists, because my my uh, experience, present has been that you know whenever I've kind of argued, I mean, uh, my next piece or follow-up piece would be coming tomorrow in Telegraph, where I've argued that this kind of a new space <laughs> has to be built. <clears throat> no, 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 that majoritarian anxiety, even if it is manufactured, uh, as you know, drawing from Jeff. Uh, Jeff's point that shared meanings have to produce. They're not easy in modern complex societies. That we are two socially differentiated, uh, you no know, standpoint theories have produced too many, uh, you know, insular kind of interpretations of reality. Moral relativism kind of taken over. So in all of that, I think producing shared meanings, common spaces becomes extremely important. Now the question often is asked: Who should do this? Obviously, the dominant are not going to do it because it's not the, in their interest to kind of generate this dominant, uh, you know, when you talk of majority and minority, majority are not going to produce. It has to be the minority. Once you pitch this question, often the question is that you're already burdening the vulnerable, you're patronizing, uh, you're kind of you know, already targeting, uh, victimizing the victim. This kind of a discourse, while I see the point, you know, also that there's a, uh, you must have seen there have been a uh, fair number of uh, you know, rejoinders to my articles where uh, people have kind of critiqued this as being too assimilationist, uh, not seeing the Sharjil Imam kind of movement that is producing a new morality, where I kind of disagree that it does not actually stand for a new morality. For me, new morality is moving towards this state space, which I think is clearly visible in the uh, farmers, uh, you know, because given their strength and numbers, farmers could have done far more uh, no, uh, mobilizational things than they have done. But I think the focus really has been in generating a new narrative. 
they have experimented with uh, accommodating dalit they have uh, gone into uh, the muslim question now they are moving uh, the, as i said the recent dialogue i had with them they are now moving towards questioning privatization they are bringing back question of public education they are bringing back idea of public good common the large number of equivalents that they are, the movement is drawing so compared to that i felt that anti ca had that kind of a limited approach but as i said that if you begin with the gender question what kind of new possibilities might emerge or uh, so so i'm also trying to look at those micro dynamics that will is there a possibility that uh, those kind of internal debates that might take place within these movements uh, uh, what new spaces uh, can they create so i'm not very sure of uh, that it would take uh, one particular kind of direction but i'm only trying to dialectically think that there are possibilities i think which we should not kind of uh, you know in our haste to kind of critique the regime it's also inadvertently doing us some good thank you <clears throat> peter uh, did you have a question did you have a question peter sorry you need no, to no i don't i'm questions. speaking next so i i just i i see okay okay um so uh, thank you ajay we don't uh, we don't have any uh, more questions that i can see right now if people want to type them in later i'll i'll let you know uh, so so we can move on to uh, our um, our next speaker um professor peter ronald de souza um he's been a long time uh, colleague here at uh, at the csds um and um he's currently uh, Uh, the Didi Koshambi Visiting Chair uh, at Goa University. Um, he's also formerly been for many years uh, a director uh, of um, the Indian Institute of Advanced Study in Shimla. Um, and uh, today he's going to be speaking to us. He's also sorry. Uh, he's also one of the co-authors of one of the volumes that we we are um, uh, tabling: um, Democratic Accommodations, Minorities in Contemporary India. and this is um, uh, co-authored by peter uh, and by my colleagues uh, hilal ahmed and mohammed uh, sanjeev alam um, uh, and it was published from bloomsbury india in 2019 um, democratic accommodation so uh, peter today will be speaking uh, i think uh, in a related vein uh, on minorities whatever happened to the politics of accommodation um please go ahead peter thank you ananya uh, can you hear me yeah okay thank you ananya and uh, thank you for organizing this and for inviting me here uh my name is a brief presentation it's uh, uh going to speak to uh just some of the issues that we raised in the book hilal has already presented some of them uh and in in some sense i think uh, my presentation uh it is not in sync with some of the presentations that have been made over the last two days uh i i say that because i want to get back to uh the normative discussion and i'm not particularly uh persuaded by some of the uh frameworks that 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 have uh, inspired uh you know the, the wonderful presentations of the last two days so let me let me try and make my case uh, i i begin my story Uh, with uh, a letter of jawaharlal nehru uh written to uh, uh, chief ministers his fortnightly letters to chief ministers this was written on 16 january 1956 and he's addressing the question of minorities and he says very very uh, clearly he says uh, minorities may be and sometimes have been troublesome and have made exaggerated claims in a democracy see however it is the will of the majority that ultimately prevails the responsibility therefore rests on the majority to not just do justice to the minority but what is more important to win over the goodwill and confidence of the minority whether it is linguistic religious or other now i think this statement in a sense summarizes uh, the whole imagination uh, that the indian state was crafting uh, for uh it's independent it's independent journey it was what we could briefly call the nehruvian imagination uh 
Uh, it was an exciting imagination. And I want to argue a little later uh, that it was an imagination which was uh, unique uh, in, in world history. And if it succeeded, uh, then it gave, it, it offered a fantastic uh, a body of examples uh, for plural societies and plural democracies uh, to emulate. Now, there are three important ideas uh, in the statement of Nehru. The first is minorities are troublesome and exaggerated. I think this is a point that hasn't come across in our presentations of the last two days. The, 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 the question of the troublesome and exaggerated minorities. How are they troublesome? They are troublesome in three normative ways. One, they make unsettling claims, unset, uh, claims which are unsettling on the claims made, uh, that, that the claims that the majority has already settled. So they make unsettling claims which the majority has to deal with. The majority has to somehow uh, accommodate them, has to somehow work with them. And the, I give the example of the whole controversy on this common civil court uh, with the insistence by the minority that we must have, uh, the Sharia must be the basis. Uh, the second is the claim to uh, change the coordinates of the polity. And, and, and by minority now, I'm. I'm also going into sexual minorities, and I think that was very valuable. The demands of, uh, you know, the LGBT movement uh, to fundamentally remove Article 377, one, and two, uh, transgender rights. So, so minorities, by and large, uh, demand a change in the normative coordinates of the polity. And I give this example. And the third is the demand. Uh, to, uh, to uh, you know, th that, that certain practices must be retained. So the point I want to make is one of the main ideas that comes across from Nehru's statement is that minorities make troublesome claims, which the majority then has to respond to. And I think we must seriously engage with that. We tend to overlook it. We, we, we get too caught up in this thing of the minority as victim and the majority as, as, as villainous. Uh, I think we need to, if we, if we are seriously talking about a plural society, then we have to look at it as the production of conflict, the production of contest. The second is when minorities make these claims, it is the majority that has to actually bear the responsibility to do justice to minority claims. So the majority carries a responsibility of responding to the minority claims. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the second point that Nehru makes, the, the idea of responsibility. And the third is the majority, therefore, has to win over the goodwill of the minority. Now, I believe independent India attempted this. I, I believe independent India, particularly because of the tragedy of partition, particularly because of the anxiety of the minorities, particularly because of the uh, great uh, members of the Constituent Assembly who debated these normative principles, established an architecture for independent India which was quite unique. Uh, it built a body of laws. We, we all know articles 25 to 30 of the constitution in the fundamental rights chapter. That means they were justiciable, uh, which was set up by the constituent assembly, assembly, giving particular rights to minorities, linguistic minorities, religious minorities, keeping out uh, the, the, uh, those who were deprived on the basis of economic or, or social categories. So one is the production of laws. Second is the uh, creation of institutions, National Commission of Minorities, National Commission of Minority Educational Institutions, State Minority Commissions, Ministry of Minority Affairs. Very interesting that the National Commission of Minorities in the course of its development recommends to the government of India to set up a ministry. It's normally see the other way around. The ministries are the powerful bodies that ask for the creation of subsidiary bodies. Whereas here it's the reverse. The third is the enactment of policies. And I, I, I identified three policy domains, cultural policies. So, so in India, for example, if you look at, if you look at uh, national festivals, many of them are religious festivals presented as national festivals. So Christmas uh, is, 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 a, is a Christian festival, but it's a, it's a oh, Good Friday. Good Friday is even better. It's a, it's a, Christian, festi it's a Christian day of religious observance. Uh, but it is presented as a national holiday. And the idea is that this modern nation that is being built has to begin to share 
on, 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 on some of the religious practices of minority groups and of the diverse plurality. So you have public national holidays, which are public holidays, uh, I mean, religious holidays, which are national holidays. You have state subsidies for the Hajj. You have a whole iconography that is being created of institutions named after uh, religious leaders of different groups, etc. Similarly, you have educational policies, so minority educational institutions. And you see a huge contestation on this. Uh, uh, Stephen's College case, the, uh, the, um, the PIES, the TMA PI case, etc., cetera, uh, where, where minority rights are being asserted, uh, where the constitutional protections are being given. And finally, you have affirmative action policies, scholarships, free coaching, multi-sector development programs, etc. This has been discussed extensively in our book by my colleague um, Ala, Sanjeev Alam. So I want to suggest that these three strategies that the, that the democratic state uh, uh, set into motion uh, were unique and exciting and, and, and uh, constitute what I call the politics of accommodation in a positive sense. You know, we, again, in our discussions over the last two days, used accommodation in a slightly negative, there's a negative tenor to it. Uh, but here I see this as a positive politics of accommodation if you have to build a plural society. And I believe that this Indian experiment was, uh, if it succeeded, uh, was going to be uh, something uh, that it could offer to the rest of the world. Uh, next slide, please. Ayodhya, uh, Kanadana, thank you. Now, this uh, politics of accommodation, I believe, uh, produces a series of conflicts. And, and, and this book that we've written actually was in conversation with Europe. And I'm going to give you five conflict situations. Again, we don't discuss this because we get trapped in a kind of uh, villainous majority, victim, minority language, but we don't look at the conflicts that emerge if we are genuinely committed to building a plural society based on you know, certain constitutional principles. Take the first case from France. Uh, uh, in France, uh, some years ago, uh, in one of the municipalities that was, uh, that was uh, controlled by the National Front, the right-wing organization in France, they decided that they were making too many concessions to the minority Muslim population. So the municipality decided that they would, uh, in school meals, uh, give meals for all children which would have pork. Earlier there was a kind of, uh, you know, children got, uh, Muslim children got turkey and, and non-Muslim children got pork. And these people said, no, no, this is our national culture. Uh, pork must be served. So the poor Muslim, Muslim children in France in this particular municipality had to go hungry because their parents had to uh, tell them that you can't eat pork and the kids were quite puzzled. Their friends were eating food, they were not eating food. Uh, they had to go hungry. So you get these kind of conflict. I mean, you'll see parallels with India, but I want to tell you as to how even the Europe of today uh, has to negotiate such conflicts which we need to engage with. So this was the first one. This is an easy sol a solution which is easy to solve. You just go back to the old system of giving pork and turkey uh, to different groups of people so that they can maintain their religious practice. The second example I take from the UK. Now in the UK, uh, the, uh, there's a particular school that pro prohibited Muslim girls below the age of eight from wearing the hijab to school on the grounds that the hijab is a, is a religious practice uh, to hide the sexuality of girls from, from, from others. So it's a, it's a way to sort of, cons you know, to, to minimize the sexuality. So for girls younger than eight who haven't reached puberty, this would, uh, the principal of the school argued that this would be um, sexualizing them even before they reach puberty. And that's, that's, uh, that's the violence to the right of the child. So they, are, they banned it. Uh, this ban was contested by the minority community in the UK. Uh, it, was, it was upheld by the uh, inspector of schools, committee who lost it. Uh, the minority community went into public protest and demanded that the principle, principle be suspended. This is an example now, a reverse example of minority intransigence. And, and the state has to now decide how to deal with this demand. Similarly, in the canton of Switzerland, uh, there was a case where two young boys from a minority community go to school. There's a practice in Switzerland when the school teacher walks into the class 
uh, he or she shakes the hand of all the students, a kind of establishment of equality. In this particular case, uh, the student was uh, uh, from the minority communities. The, the, the teacher was a woman. The children refused to shake the hand of the woman, saying their religious practice does not allow uh, women uh, then to touch the hand of another woman, again, because of sexual overtones. Uh, the local solution was, okay, you don't shake the hand of any teacher. Uh, and, uh, but, but modern media, national television picked it up and it became a huge national controversy and the students were suspended, suspended from school. Now, again, here we have a situation which needs to be negotiated between the communities in terms of, you know, is this a fundamental requirement of the religion? Is it just a cultural practice that is evolved? But that doesn't happen. You, you get a kind of minority intransigence. The parents took the children out of the school and, and refused to compromise on the question of shaking hands, which meant if you shook, if you did not shake hands, you were, you were expressing gender inequality. If you shook hands, your religious or your cultural practice was being compromised. So again, a conflict. The third one we all know, uh, the fourth is about the Sabri Mala, a case which is now becoming very difficult where all groups in Kerala are trying to sort of distance themselves, except perhaps for the left, a bit from the uh, from the decision of the Supreme Court that women would be allowed to sabari mala. So, so uh, how does one negotiate this? In the earlier two religious conflicts, whether it was the entrance to Haji Ali or Shani Shingnapur Temple in, in Amatnagar district, uh, it was quite clear. Women, you know, everybody supported women's uh, entry into these religious places where they were debarred. But in sabari mala. Uh, people are backing off because it's because there's a pushback from 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 religious orthodoxy. Uh, again, we have to and and uh, the point I'm making is that we don't engage with these questions enough because we we get caught up in certain ideological silos. And the toughest question is the last one. When it comes down to female circ circumcision or what is called female genital mutilation, I think there's a general agreement that uh, that we must protect the child and we must uh, ban the practice. So when it comes down to uh, the case of uh, the border women, uh, it's now the case is still, I think, pending before the Supreme Court. But the same principle of the rights of the child versus religious practice is not exercised to men. So there's no objection to male circumcision among communities that practice it on religious grounds. Uh, I give these five examples because I want us to recognize that if we want to build a plural society, uh, we need to consistently be liberal. We cannot we cannot use liberal language, but not uh, but but uh, and you know have the liberal gaze only against the majority and not look at ourselves. The liberal gaze must be consistent, and and and, and a plural society is going to require us to negotiate some of these very difficult situations. But uh, the, the, the Nehruvian project has now come to a standstill. In fact, it's been reversed, and that's the tragedy. The tragedy is that the politics of accommodation, which I was uh, speaking about with so much excitement, has now been presented as a policy of consistent appeasement of the minority. And this has been done uh, by the uh, Parivar, and it's not just populism. I think that I, I, I'm increasingly unhappy with, with the overemphasis on the term populism uh, to explain uh, what is happening. What we are seeing is the ecosystem of the, of the Sangha Parivar that is through a, through a series of strategies uh, produced an, uh, a public discourse uh, which has converted the politics of accommodation to the politics of appeasement. Uh, so they have through a very formidable, I mean if you look at it in terms of rumor, if you look at it in terms of uh, the the, you know, the the panna uh, uh, you know cut, uh, workers. If you look at it at every level of mobilization, you would be simply amazed. Including now WhatsApp group, you would be amazed at how consistently through the mobilization of a formidable ecosystem, they have begun to change the perception of politics. Now Ajay's point is very optimistic, and we'd like to see when the election results come. Uh, you know, whether the farmers have been able to make an impact. Uh, because the second thing is not just a formidable ecosystem, they have phenomenal resources available to them. They have a, a, a dominant 
public presence in the media, in the, in the mainstream media, but most of all, it is the capacity to create a very large and a very successful digital uh, ecosystem, which they have done. I mean, you, we, this has been presented and mentioned, uh, but the, the, the space at which, at the speed at which, I mean, you see the Prashant Kishore case just now, he makes some statement and, you know, uh, the, the president of the BJP has gone on record saying that within a few minutes, they can have 50,000 WhatsApp groups uh, presenting the same argument. So we need to look at what that is doing in terms of creating this perception. And of course, one of the elements of changing this perception is the, rhetor is the rhetorical skills of the leader. The, the, the question of what you call populism or what I would prefer to call demagogy. Now, does this work? Yes. Yeah. Quantitative data, if you look at election commission of India data, over the decade from 2009 to 2019, the BJP's vote bank has uh, vote share has gone up from 18.18% to 37.36%. And this is at a time when demonetization has occurred, when there's huge farmers distress in states like Maharashtra and UP and, and Northern India, when, when GST has disrupted uh, the, the uh, activities of uh, uh, small traders, when, you know, something else is happening and we need to ask that question. And that's, are we looking at the wrong place? And I would suggest that we are, we are, we are relying on uh, approaches and frameworks which don't quite work, which, which, which are not particularly sensitized uh, to the context and history. So, you know, uh, you, can, you can talk like Varshney talks about a robust civil society where there will be fewer, uh, fewer uh, less violence, yet we see a lot of violence in areas where there are robust civil society like Bengal. Or uh, you can uh, have uh, Wilkinson's thesis that where there are many parties, uh, there will be less violence. Again, that's not true. We are seeing that, that there's a lot of violence in, in states where there are a lot of parties uh, and so on. Uh, and I think the same works for the populist argument. And, and so I'm not, I mean, I, I think we need to try and understand that something else is happening. We're looking at the wrong place, but we have to ask a more fundamental question. And my fundamental question is this. One, uh, did the Nehruvian framework fail because it was far too rational? It, it, it ignored, even though, as Ananya mentioned, it, it, you know, he mentioned this in his discovery of how he the connect with the, with the masses when he speaks. Um, it, the Nehruvian campaign did not connect up with the whole symbolic world, did not co connect up with the whole cultural world, did not connect up with the cultural ecosystem in which most people are located. And that is why it gets undermined so easily. That is why the RSS, which knows this, which mobilizes, uh, Badri Narayan has a fascinating argument of how the RSS uses small cultural practices in, in particular localities and makes them part of the larger Hindu mainstream. I think that's absolutely correct. So it is that which then produces this mythology. And that mythology, of course, is then fed by the by the by all the uh, instruments of the demagogue, uh, technological, rhetorical, linguistic, uh, fash, uh, you know, clothes, uh, sartorial, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So you begin to create a, a, a mindset uh, which then taps into these anxieties, which what what I call taps into uh, the the uh, the prejudices which are already there, the prejudices of the. Uh, the, the, against the minority. Uh, next, next slide, please. Yeah. And that's my final slide. So, so how do we then counter this? I mean, uh, yesterday Mujib was very despondent, uh, and and I shared his despondency at least some degree of you know, some way. And I think the only answer is for us to go back to the Nehruvian model and to and to and to uh, aggressively campaign without uh, without uh, a sense of ambivalence. Uh, for that. Today, there's a lot of ambivalence. The liberal voice has become so ambivalent. And, and, and part of that ambivalence is because the liberal framework has been uh, delegitimized in, 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 in the academic metropolis. And we borrow from that academic metropolis. Uh, whereas what we need is to restate that Nehruvian voice. We need to rethink those three principles that, we found, that one could extract from Nehru. Uh, and you see that. You see that because I, I, I think uh, I, I have an 
unwavering belief in, 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 in basic humanism. And, and, and if, if the liberal voice can restate that aggressively uh, without, without ambivalence, uh, we will be able to uh, create a counter discourse. At the moment, the discourse is all the other way. The, the farmers movement is beginning to set the seeds of that counter discourse, but, but, uh, but uh, the farmers movement will also face, I mean, does, uh, uh, do the Haryana farmers, uh, you know, how have they come, how, how, what is their view on Kap panchayats, right? So you're going, to, you're going to come up with these moral conflicts that I identified. And, and then, of course, in the last two days, there's been this fascinating video that's going the rounds of a Kerala Medical College uh, couple that that danced to the Rasputin challenge, and and uh, the, the 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 right wing or the the you know the religious mindset challenged it because the two dancers were from different religious communities. I've given you the web link, uh, and um, these the, the young people fought back, and and now there's a huge. Uh, what is called the Rasputin Dance Challenge in colleges right across uh, Kerala, if not if not uh, southern India. So I believe that's where the investment must come, uh, and the investment has to be normative, and the investment must come uh, without ambiguity. Thank you. I uh, am not seeing any questions in the Q and A box. So I'll just get us started, and um, then uh, Prashant uh, will ask you his question. I, um, I mean, I'm absolutely in agreement with you that there has to be a fight back. There has to be uh, an attempt to regroup. That uh, the liberal point of view must uh, reassert itself, uh, etc. Um, but you have also witnessed like uh, I have, like everyone has, that uh, there's been such a brutal attack and pushback uh, on any kind of dissent in the last uh, six, seven, eight years, um, from students to Dalits to uh, minorities to women to farmers to, to Muslim women to left-wing campuses. Um, to uh, activists, lawyers, filmmakers, intellectuals. I mean, I don't need to tell you how many people are in jail, uh, how many people have lost their jobs, uh, how many people have been forced to uh, quit institutions, to shut down their nonprofits, uh, to uh, you know uh, undergo audits and and uh, uh, you know enforcement directorate raids and 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 IT uh, income tax department raids and uh, to to lose their funding or uh, you know uh, I mean this kind of um, harassment uh, ultimately does add up to uh, astounding silences. Uh, not because people stop believing that they need to fight back, but because people are simply uh, disabled uh, through the sheer <clears throat> brute uh, uh, force of, of, of the state that is lined up against them. Uh, and I mean, you know, it can begin with like uh, trolling, which, which, which one might be able to handle perhaps. Uh, but, but when it becomes this kind of, uh, you know, incarceration, the use of really scary uh, sort of and, and, and you know, non bailable sorts of uh, uh, national security laws, uh, extreme targeting, demonization uh, of, of, of intellectuals and dissenters, uh, students, uh, even girls and women, um, you know, are not spared in this uh, sort of uh, very kind of physical, visceral uh, constraint, uh, constraint that is sought to be put. I mean, I don't, I don't really understand, uh, you know, how uh, you expect that the, the, you know, the clear voice of reason uh, will, will continue to ring out uh, when daily the dangers are mounting in the way that we have seen and, and people's lives have, have suffered and changed uh, in ways that we could not even have expected maybe five years ago. So, uh, I mean, what, what, is your, what is your practical solution to, to our desire as high-minded, normatively uh, anchored and, and moral uh, you know, citizens 
uh, to 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 push back against this kind of fascist uh, fascist uh, environment. Please unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. No, I don't want to give the impression that I think things have, you know, the fight back has started, the counter discourse is robust, and 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 uh, we are going to see a reversal. I'm just, I'm at the moment giving 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 an uh, an analytical picture of of a kind of direction in which we need to head. Having said that, I believe that there are cases that we need to look at very carefully, and which. <laughs> Your connection is not good. Systems, if not, Kerala one need. We need to. Some. We we we. I lost the last minute of what you said. The second is Tamil Nadu. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, uh, Peter, we lost you there for a, for a second. Could you please repeat yourself? Just whatever you said immediately. Yeah, I'm I'm saying I I I began by saying that I don't think that this is you know the, that uh, things are rosy and we are you know the, the the resistance has begun. The counter the counter discourse has started. I I made that argument because I want us to be clear in our minds that that is the way in which we must. Make our effort now. Is that happening elsewhere? I think there are three sites that we need to look at very carefully. One is Kerala, right? Uh, I, I think it's it's going to be very interesting to see uh, how this this video that I that I referred to plays out. At the moment, the the young people are. I mean, the, the, there's a huge excitement on campuses across Kerala, at least as as reported in the media, uh, and they they call it. Resistance. They are, they, you you talk of hate. Uh, we will resist that uh, with with our uh, with our attitude of love. Now it's going to be very interesting to see how orthodox groups from which these two uh, dancers come respond to the act of dancing. I'm 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 curious to see. I mean I uh, I'm curious to see how the orthodox uh, religious communities from 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 which these two people come respond to what is a you know, a very forward-looking, a very progressive uh, performance. Uh, so, 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 how will Kerala handle this? That's one. Second is what's happening, going to happen in Tamil Nadu. Why is it that, in spite of its efforts, I think the B, the, the 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 RSS ecosystem will not make much of uh, an electoral success in Tamil Nadu. And the third, of course, is uh, is uh, Bengal. In Bengal, uh, it's very interesting that if you read the papers of the last two days, young people are using all these mobilization techniques uh, that the BJP has mastered uh, to actually uh, respond uh, on behalf of the TMC. So something is happening. There is a counter discourse happening using the same technologies of mobilization in three very important states. Uh, will that be able to be replicated elsewhere? I think we'll have to see, but at least we must be clear that that is the direction in which we need to go. I think Peter, that that clarity is is very much there, and in in Delhi we have seen a repeated effort, especially on the part of young people, uh, at Jamia, at JNU, in Shahin Bagh, uh, to to come out and to say no and to swear by the constitution and so on and so forth. And this, these movements have gone viral all across India. Uh, we, the farmers are just sitting there for the last six months uh, and uh, you know, no, no, no responses forthcoming, uh, which, which helps them at all to, uh, in, in any kind of forward uh, movement. And, and a lot of the students who spoke out in exactly the way that that young people are doing in Kerala, uh, as you point out, find themselves incarcerated with no future uh, release in sight. So I'm not, you know, I'm I'm really not very optimistic. Uh, I, I I can't dispute that that uh, you know, of course this needs to happen and it needs to go on happening no matter what. But uh, you know, ultimately we are seeing uh, people being victimized. Uh, for uh, uh, their difference of opinion from the regime and that no dissent is being tolerated. 
uh, and right from people being killed to people being jailed to people uh, you know having their their lives and careers ruined i think uh, these are pretty heavy prices that to pay and that that you know we can't really put all the onus on our young people and demand that you know they just be in this continuous state of of battle while we have allowed all our institutions to to collapse uh, and fail to protect them in any way uh, starting with the courts anyway i i want to give prashant uh, a chance to to ask his question and uh, and then we'll have to close uh, for lunch at least for a brief brief interval please go ahead peter thank you you know uh, it's great to see the the humanity of that you have always have been still uh, quite firmly there uh, having said that you know i would just like to <clears throat> take a point that you made at the end when you say that you know is nehruvianism was it too rational and then you said well it it possibly was because uh, the whole idea of symbolism is something that uh, it may have eluded uh, many of the old school uh, liberals uh, now uh, from that that particular point that you made and the examples that you gave you know five or six examples from europe but it could be anywhere in the world uh, i found those very visceral examples um, very all to do with senses all to do with physicality uh, food uh, sexuality uh, dress things like that you must have chosen those, those advisedly and and i was thinking as you were uh, as you were presenting the whole symbolic aspect of those uh, those uh, uh, the whole symbolic aspect of uh, yes and am i am i audible yeah. yes yeah. yeah the symbolic aspect of those examples that you gave you know uh, i'm not suggesting that we leave the enlightenment project it's not just nehruvianism as i see the whole 300 years of enlightenment project is in, is being challenged now in various ways uh uh having said that the whole idea of symbolism and as a student of literature you know um, i think about people I, i who used to go further in deeper into india uh, and and you know and look at um, so all of us know those those people you know panishonath renu premchand you know so many bengali novelists that we grew up with and so on you know we are not seeing those novels coming up because of i don't know why because exactly the point that you are probably making that how to how to bring back accommodation into the picture which is a very powerful uh, powerful uh, philosophy uh, and at the same time um, have faith in enlightenment i would say somewhere and yet go into the symbolism i'm thinking of, of sometimes i think of ernest cassirer you know who was a great as all of us know enlightenment uh, thinker and yet he wrote books on mythology and symbolic forms you know someone like cassirer or others who could in indian indian uh, context there are many others uh, who have done that so i i just want to uh, ask you you know if you are getting the drift of my point you know how to push your point about symbolism and the senses further and have a different uh, idea of accommodation that you were talking about thank you prashant in fact you 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 summarized my position even better than i did i think you 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 you, you really you, you really got the sense of what i was trying to say Uh, and i i agree with you that uh, we need to push it further and 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 i think we therefore need to look at resources that we've not been looking at so far uh, we need to look at for example uh, the literatures in the bhasas they are far more they are far more ironical they are far more satirical they are far more dismissive of uh, of uh, the the uh, you know the, the hegemonic ideological frame today i mean read for example bhairappa's uh, uh, parva i mean the things he says in in kannada you can't say in english and yet it's a phenomenal or read uh, shivaji savant's uh, mrityunjay the things he says there about arjun and the things he says about uh, some of the you know the, the sort of grand characters of the mahabharata you can't say in english uh, mf hussain tried to do that and you see what happened to him so 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 i'm saying that there are these resources available to us we just need to use them in english but unfortunately we don't we we uh, our intellectual you know our intellectual gaze is elsewhere and i'm saying to you that there are huge resources available to us which which the folk know which the folk know 
I mean, there's this classic story of uh, of uh, lawyer telling uh, M. F. Hussain that you know you're painting the the, the Rama and uh, only for the rich people. Why don't you do something for the poor? Why don't you take your paintings and see how the how the poor behave? So he takes sixteen he takes sixteen big uh, canvases that he's done of the Ramayan to a village sixty kilometers out, outside Hyderabad, where a performance of the Ramayan is taking place in the folk tradition, and the people are absolutely happy with. It. They, they don't they don't see anything wrong with Ram's eyes being out of shape or the nose being out of shape or you know, given his modernist style. So I'm saying to you that there are all these cultural resources available to us. We need to deploy them. in our english language theorization we don't do that we don't do that not just in in access to these resources we don't do that even in the language we use so that's my first point we don't we don't draw on the concepts and categories we uh, rukmini bhai and i and i published a book called keywords for india i don't know if you've seen it in which we we have tried to go far beyond the raymond williams framework you know uh, there's a whole lot of words there which are part of everyday speech which we are trying to elevate uh, into into the language of social science discourse that's my first point but my second point is so thank you prashanta for that is to ananya's uh, response to my earlier intervention and it's simply to say that you see we when i say we need to strengthen the liberal voice we need to do that not just vis-a-vis the state i agree with you there are a lot of dangers when you when when the liberal voice in a sense speaks to the state's perfidy but there are lots of there is a lot of tyranny within society as well and the liberal voice doesn't change the gaze towards society i mean i remember a case many years ago when i was when i was researching this whole thing on freedom of expression where a group of young girls in the kashmir valley for example started a band 15 year olds right they they created a musical thing and uh, there was a fatwa against them they had to dis- uh look at some of the first that the global offense so 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 not to to uh, camouflage our liberal voice with our minority heart which is which is what i think we we, we tend to do um okay so uh there is a the question does mujib yeah, have there is sorry there is one more question and we are almost at 1 o'clock so i would like us actually to break at 1 o'clock uh so which leaves us 5 minutes uh, mujib for your question and uh, peter for your answer at that point uh, just to let you know i mean we'll be fully half an hour off schedule so we'll take a break from 1 to 1:30 and we'll come back with uh, with our uh, closing papers uh, at 1:30 india time um uh, which will be half an hour later than we had hoped uh, okay muji please go ahead and then we'll we'll close for for uh, yeah i don't have a question i just have a small comment uh, to this now if you look back uh, and to the entire discourse uh, with regard to the rise of hindu right or bjp you know in the early 90s and uh, after demolition of babri masjid uh, and all of that uh, there was this argument uh, quite uh, quite popular among intellectuals that bjp the kind of politics it plays about ram janmabhoomi and all of that that works in north but will never work in south bjp can never make it south and that is the argument and but i remember had a meeting with the with an editor of epw krishna raj in his office He fiercely argued with this. You know, you are just an alarmist. You are just unnecessarily getting anxious about all these things about it. But we saw BJP entering Karnataka. Uh, who knew about BJP doing what it did in uh, Kashmir? In fact, Swapan Das Gupta himself told uh, at a gathering at CPR that you know we never expected either Ajodhya or 370. Uh, either Ajodhya would happen or 370 removal would happen about it. So uh, as we understand, you know, so I, I, I am on the one hand, you know, I understand the optimism uh, and and all these bright spots you are trying to suggest that exist and which we can build on. Uh, but unfortunately, it's the Mamta Banerji, it's the Farooq Abdullah who are the partners in consolidating and in, in accelerating the Hindu right movement uh, and legitimizing all of that stuff about it. 
And so clearly there are two, two ways. One is an intellectual response on which you are commenting on. Uh, where we are lacking is this uh, intellectual response is relatively easy. You just don't have national resources. You also have a global resources to contribute to. What is more important is this electoral and political resources where you want to challenge. And that's where I think the real crisis is. Uh, you know, for instance, one small thing. Uh, uh, I just want to conclude with that. Uh, you know, you have all this, uh, this is a very non-leftist response. You have all this uh, Sarva Dharma, uh, inter-religious prayers happening. You know, Gandhi used to do that. Uh, you know, one of the ways to messaging that people of all religion on all texts matter and there are good things about all texts. Now, there are no political parties does it. You know, if they do this, in fact, that would be a great counter narrative to Hindutvist movement or the, or the Brahminical uh, ideas and all of Rajiv, that. Thanks for yeah, thank running out of time. Yeah, Peter, just have a yeah, no, I, 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 I would agree with Pajit. Yes, uh, but that's that, that. I mean, the point I want to make is, therefore, it's incumbent on the liberal voice to ask the question as to why is it that the BJP has been able to spread in states like, like Karnataka. And I think, you see, there, there's an elephant in the room that nobody wants to name. Because we, you know, we, we are all part of a certain discourse and, 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 uh, and the elephant in the room is that the BJP is able to tap into some grievance that, that the majority community has. What is that grievance? Where does it come from? How is it propagated? Why does it take root? How do we contest it? These are questions we need to ask. That is why, for example, I mean, you you know, I wrote a piece some days ago in the Indian Express on uh, engineer Sridharan standing for the BJP in Kerala. And I, it, was, it shocked me that a man of such eminent engineering capabilities, when he, when he enters politics, begins to mouth the kind of um, naive perspectives that somebody has been propagating. He actually thinks that this is the way to go. So why does it work? Why does a, you know, I mean, as an engineer, he's, he's equal to, he, he's second to none, you know, unequaled actually, not just second to none. You know, he, he's, the, the things he's been able to do for this country. And yet when it comes down to his understanding of Indian society, Indian future, Indian culture, etc., he's speaking of, he uses the language of love jihad. He uses the language, you know, I mean, in Kerala, he talks in terms of dietary habits. So some, there is something about the grievance which BJP has been able to tap into, which we don't fully understand and we need to investigate. And that's my point. When I say liberal discourse, I don't mean just go out there and fight the state. We need to expand the space. This, this space has never been occupied. It's too feeble. It's too feeble. I mean, uh, Mujib mentioned, uh, you know, Mamta and, and Farooq Abdullah giving legislation to the BJP. The BJP got legitimacy even when the left joined, if you remember, when there were two seats uh, in the, during the, during the uh, 19, 1980s. When they... First election. Yeah. So, so you see, so when I say that it is incumbent for us to be clear-minded, uh, you know, your, the history that we've looked at shows a history which is confused. So they think you can be strategic and you can somehow tame, tame the tiger. You can't tame the tiger. You have to be absolutely clear-minded that the only way forward is to reassert a Nehruvianism, which we have abandoned. That's my point. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. Thanks for your questions, Mujib, uh, Prashanta. Um, we have only one uh, final speaker remaining. Uh, that's Volker Kaul uh, from, uh, from Rome. Uh, he's my co-editor on our volume. And so he will both speak about his own work uh, and our volume and he will um, and he will close out the conference. So uh, Volker, if you don't mind, uh, let's break now and meet in half an hour. Yeah, is that okay? I'm fine with that. Yes. We're fine with that. Yes, okay. let's do that. All right. So we'll come back in half an hour at 1.30 uh, India time and, uh, and see you all then. Okay. okay. Thanks. Perfect. Bye. See you later. Yeah. You know, to engage and to represent the other, you know, the, the fear and the danger is there, right? And and so, um, but uh, but 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 I hope, you know, I really hope that you know, for those for the comparative purposes, purposes, and you know, 
um, you know, engaging with each other, you know, it, it's also a learning process. So, so, so probably, I mean, if there, if, you know, if mistakes are, are, are done, you know, it is only through, 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 through an engagement with, with another that, you know, that we can, but you can learn of that mistakes and, 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 and do it somehow better. So, so, so the Orientalist, you know, the Orientalist stance on, on, on this is that it, as a matter of fact, that it, you know, almost inhibits, you know, uh, closer encounters, right? So, 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 whereas, you know, whereas we are all quite aware of, you know, of, of the danger and, 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 you know, of, um, of the trap, of the rentalist trap, I, I hope that, that, that the project really tried and, and, and did avoid it. Okay, so, so, okay, so now, then the point is, you know, in, in two years into the project, you know, the, the, the populist question exploded, right? So, so, so it was, you know, it was clear in Europe that, you know, with the financial crisis, you know, in France, in Italy, um, in Germany, in Great Britain, populist forces, they, they gained, you know, they gained, they gained force. And, and, you know, and, and what was, you know, what was then so surprising and to some extent so disturbing then, right, is that, you know, the very, very same thing that happened in, 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 in India with the election of, of Modi in 2014. And, and so suddenly, you know, so suddenly, you know, we, we were facing each other and saying, okay, oh, look, I mean, look, I mean, even if, you know, even if you have completely different political approaches uh, to the question of pluralism and minorities, on the one hand, you have the liberal project, on the other hand, you have the more multicultural project, right? Both these projects seem to have failed, and they seem to have given rise to uh, to populist forces. And you know, and 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 there was just this, this perplexity, okay. And and you know, and it is exactly out of this perplexity then that that this book, uh, Ananias, and 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 my uh, my edited book, uh, that it that it that it was born, okay. So that. That suddenly, you know, we put, you know, we put this question on the table, right? So, so minority and pluralism was the initial problem, and we thought that multiculturalism might perhaps be a better answer than than the liberal nationalist one, right? And now, and now, we 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 were we were facing the question of populism, which was, you know, and seemed to to stand in the direct and, you know, in in in. In a very natural, no, natural. I don't say natural, but in a, in a, yeah. But it was very strongly related to 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 the question of minorities. Okay, so this is this is the question. So the relationship of populism and minorities in in, in South Asia, India, and Europe. That's the question of the book. Okay, and now I think you can find in the book you can find two takes, or better say, two readings of that of that of that relationship. Right. So one point, one reading is that that relationship is a question of identity, you know, that populism, after all, as, you know, as once would said, it is a majoritarian, identitarian project fighting back the accommodations of minorities and pluralism over the last decades, okay. And, 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 you know, it is, you know, and, and you have, you have, would have the Hindu case in, in, in India, you would, you know, you would have more than the, the nationalist major, the, the, the national case against immigrants and, and, you know, Muslim minorities in Europe. And, and, you know, and, and many of the, you know, many of the contributors, you know, most of the contributors, as a matter of fact, they, they, they read, they read the relationship in these terms and they made different proposals on this, right? That, how to solve this identity conflict with, between, you know, a majority and, 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 and a minority, right? Hilal Ahmed, for example, he, he, you know, he favored, you know, he, he, he addressed the question and, and, and he proposed the political representation of Muslims, right? As Varan uh, Shiridan, he, he, he also addressed the point of view from, from the electoral, uh, from, the, from the electoral system in India, and, and he proposed, you know, more, uh, proportional electoral systems, which would benefit minorities and which would be able to accommodate minorities. So, so, so generally, you know, the question, you know, the question of, of, of populism and minorities was addressed through this identitarian point of view, you know, that you have two identities or several identities which were opposing, right, and you had to find ways how to, how to come to terms with those identities. Okay. Now there is there is a minority, as I said, there is a minoritarian second point of view, a second reading, you know, which 
which I think you find in, uh, in Azai, but also in Wilkin Lika, part of, and which would say, well, look, forget about the minority things, you know, just, just forget that populism, even if, as I said, even if it is, you know, even if, you know, it is anti-pluralist. It, it really is against minorities, right? I mean, I don't want to deny that, but, but you know, deep down, the, you know, the reason for populism has nothing to do with minorities, but basically with inequalities and new forms of neoliberalism, okay? And I just want to quote Ajay on this uh, from the book, and he, he, he wrote that, you know, the nationalist narrative in this context has an underlying social narrative of politicizing the subjectivity of an emergent new cultural subaltern that exists across castes and classes. Okay, so so he makes this connection between you know between between you know be, be, between the nationalist narrative and the social narrative. Okay, so that there is that there is an in, inherent connection between the nationalist question and you know the social question, the social question ling lingering in the background, right? And and you know and and it is exactly you know and and I would you know I would like to 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 analyze this the second point of view you know this I will call it institutionalist point of view a little bit further, and and you know and and here starts then a little bit more my you know uh, my, my my personal reflections on 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 populism and and minorities okay so 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 my point of view is. So my point of departure is, you know, as I'm really asking, is populism really uh, addressed against minorities, or uh, is populism not the result of the way our social our social institutions globally work nowadays? Okay. Now, generally, you know, the answer is, and you know, and and liberals and and liberals really really believe that you know that that. That populism is actually about identity politics, and then if you have a look in the, you know, at the very first analysis of populism, you know Jan, I would just quote Jan van der Muller, but you know you would have also William Galston, but also Albert Wheel. You know these are all liberal people, right? And when you when you uh, uh, when they tried to 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 engage with populism, what they said is now that you know, for example, Muller he maintains that. The core claim of populism is a moralized form of anti-pluralism. Okay, populists have a particularist, a particular moralistic imagination of politics. Okay, so so the stance is, you know, we really have to do here with, you know, xenophobic, racist, anti-pluralist uh, point of view. And in you know, the way that liberals try to engage with them, right? Try to engage with this populist discourses and say, and this is then, you know, to say that, you know, they really should avoid the, the so-called essentialist trap, you know. What they would say is that, you know, that that the way that populists frame collective identities is based upon erroneous conceptions of collective identities, okay? So, and they want to revise this picture. They want to show the truth, the real truth, which is underlying those collective identities, okay? Applying, you know, concepts of history, of culture, of theology, and showing, you know, that, you know, that, that, you know, the nationalist and identitarian project of populism uh, is, after all, based upon, based upon lies, okay? And, and I just want to show this is, you know, more or less you have this book here by by Anthony Appia, you know, The Lies That Bind. You know, if you want to really have uh, and really have uh, a very concise and, 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 and you know, a very, uh, a very clever uh, approach, a liberal approach to populism, just have a look at that book, you know, where, where Appia is addressing, um, you know, the question of religion, the question of uh, nationalism, the question of of race, and he's showing, right? He's showing how populists misconstrue those uh, those collective identities, and 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 he is then trying to 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 argue, you know, that what, as a matter of fact, what those what those identities really are. Okay, so um, so 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 liberals, you know, when they engage with when they engage with populists, they would just, you know, they would insist, you know, that identities, after all, you know, they are constructed, invented, imagined, and so forth, right? They are the product of reasons, you know? And, and so far as they are 
the product of reasons, you know, we can we can engage engage in liberation in a discussion with the populists, and eventually, you know, what then liberals uh, in the wake of Rawls would call an overlapping consensus. Right? We can we, we can come to terms with that, right? I mean, this is the best hope that liberals have, you know, that you know, trying to reason, trying to show that there are uh, that the, the justification the justificationary project of uh, of populism of populist does not work and trying to convince them by way of reason that by way of practical reason that they should accept something of a more liberal framework right now so this is if you believe really that so this is the approach that you take when you really believe that populism is eventually about identity politics and is deep down an identitarian project right now, if you believe that it has and it is rooted in the way our social institutions work today, right? It, you know, it just, you know, it just makes no sense to address questions of culture, of theology, of 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 um, of race and so forth, right? Because that's, you know, that's that's not the motivating force of populism. And so. Of course, you know, what you would do is, you know, what you would try to do is if you even if you have those institutionalist perspective, you know, you would try to contain populism, right? You, you, uh, you the first answer, you know, is to really protect legally, politically, but also physically the, uh, the minorities against against the mob, as, as, as Prashanta would say, okay? But, but you would not stop there, right? You not you would not just stop in, in protecting minorities. You would just you would tackle those social institutions, which, according to your reading, right, have given rise to uh, to, to populism and and to those group conflicts. And and you know and you would seek a reform of those social institutions in a way that those identitarian projects that those social groups start to lose their sense, start to lose their the reason for existence okay now this doesn't mean of course that you go there with the law and say you 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 abolish you abolish religions and you abolish cultures okay that's that that's obviously not the case but what you would do is uh, you would bring about an institutional reform where you're right which would would make it that the group consciousness right lose its political and social salience right and that identity politics at large becomes a little bit less rational. Okay, so uh, so from this point of view, you know, um, from this from the institutional point of view, liberalism uh, to some extent, you know, uh, with its insistence on, on on freedom and autonomy, it is it is brutally concealing the different power relations that social institutions allow. Okay, so so just liberalism does not only you know. Does not only protect those people from those injustices of the social institutions, but then it is going to criticize those people, right? It's going to criticize those people that they're going to defend themselves with the help of identity politics. So, so, um, so, so, and I feel it's really problematic. Okay, so now, um, so, so here, so here is my point then. Okay, so here is my thesis then. Okay, I would like to argue then that the populist nation. Uh, you know, which we can find, you know, in both Europe and in India, after all, is not so nationalist, right? Nationalism is fooled by grievances and resentment, as, you know, this, we, 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 we had this yesterday in Christoph's talk, but probably also in Ananya's talk today. And it is little more than a desperate, ill-conceived reaction, you know, a cry for help. You know, nothing, nothing more, nothing less, to a very serious problem that goes back in my reading to global capitalism. Okay. Now I want to present a very, you know, it, it's really, I will, I, I hope not to take out more than five to ten minutes to present, you know, a, a, a very brief analysis of Italian populism because I believe that, you know, it, it shows the very reactionary character of nationalism. Okay. And you know, even if now, and and I'm apologizing, my my analysis is going to be very rough. You know, it's going to be. I'm not. I'm not a. You know, even if I'm a trained political scientist, I'm not a practicing political scientist. So, so it is going to be. You know, it is going to be very intuitionist. You know, and very. You know, I I, I will really um, just paint the 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 the, the, the uh, you know the broader picture. Okay. 
And, uh, you know, and, and I guess we can start here from, from a working definition. You know, most people, they try to avoid definitions of populism, but I believe that you can do that. And, and I go along with the definition given by, you know, by Anastasia Laclau, by, um, by Chantal Mouffe, and, and perhaps also Cass Mode, who says, you know, what populism after all is about. You know, there is a people, you know, there is the underdog, and there is an elite, okay? There is the establishment there of those in power, okay? So I, I, I would go along with that definition with that you know, very conflictual definition of populism, that populism is oppositional with respect to a certain group, which is the people in power and the elite and so forth. But let's have a look who are the people for, um, uh, who are the people for the two populist uh, parties in, in Italy. And I said, you know, you have on the one hand, you have the league at the right, and you have the, the, the five star movement on the left. So let me start with the league. So who are the people of the league? Now, the people of the league. Now, let me start with, with the elite. Who is the elite for the league? The elite who they address is Europe. Okay. It's in particular the master's criteria and the euro and some, you know, and, and the left and the left wing establishment that allowed for immigration. Now, this sounds more like, you know, a very straightforward nationalist protectionist project, right? But if you have a look at, at their policy proposal, at the main policy proposal, it, it's a flat tax. You know, it's a flat tax of 15%, you know, and this, as a matter of fact, doesn't, is, is convenient, is very convenient for business people and employees who don't depend too much on the welfare state. It's not convenient for the other people. So accordingly, you know, the people, you know, the people of, of the league, you know, it's not the nation of Italy as such, you know, the people of the league, they there are two social categories. Now, it's one is the business people from the north, right? The small and medium business people from the north, and the second are the employees of those of, of those companies and factories. Okay. So the question is now, what kind of nationalism is that, right? So this this, this sort of you know, it is a sort of neoliberal nationalism and protectionism, it is really tailored upon the needs of, of, of those small to medium sized businesses, which have lost enormously uh, in competitiveness over the last over last decades with, 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 with globalization now. But, but, you know, I think the more interesting thing which is to note here is that, you know, that the employees of those businesses who, you know, who with, with the trade unions were, you know, they were the opponents of them. They really hated, you know, they, you know there, was real, there was a real conflict between employees and employers and in Italy that they suddenly turned out to be allies of, of, those, uh, of, of those companies and of, of, of actually of, of, the, of the class of entrepreneurs, right? So, so how came that about, you know, and, and, and very quickly, you know, the, uh, um, the labor market in, you know, in Europe increasingly liberalized and, you know, and protections were dismissed and, 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 and suddenly, you know, suddenly with globalization, companies could move their, um, their, their production abroad. And, and so you, you were in a situation of a decline of trade unions and, 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 you know, where, you know, where interests of the working class, you know, being the work and, and of the entrepreneurial class sun the light i mean this this, is, this was unheard about you know and 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 so this national uh, this ne neoliberal nationalism is to some extent you know it is an answer to the european and global neoliberalism nothing less and nothing more okay now this is not the whole question because if we have a look at, at, on the left, right, you have the Five Star Movement and, you know, the people of the Five Star Movement, they are just a whole complete other social category, right? The people are the unemployed, the precariat, the gig and self-employed uh, employers. Uh, so the gig and self-employed employers, uh, sort of, you know, you could call this almost a post-modern uh, lumpen proletariat, right? And, you know, and the Five Star Movement, you know, as you can imagine, they, they, just, they, they just deeply and profoundly oppose, oppose the, the neoliberal proposal of, of, of the flat tax. And what they favor is an enlargement of, of social, of social um, welfare services in, in notably the universal basic income. Okay. So now the elite of the Five Star Movement is, you know, it's to some extent it is, you know, it is the entire Italian social class, right? Because they they call it the case, which is, you know, interesting from your perspective, uh, that to some extent allowed, you know, uh, neoliberalism to take place. So in conclusion, you have the, you know, um, that the right and the left wing populism they address very different people, you know. 
Uh, so on the one hand, you know, the right populism, actually, they are the proletariat of Marx, which was Marx uh, envisaging, okay, and they, they suddenly became rightist voters, okay, neoliberal rightist voters. And on the other hand, you have a completely new social class, uh, which are those um, uh, precarious and uh, the, the precarious workers in, 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 those, in these neoliberal economies, okay. And, you know, and so you have two different forms of people and you have two different forms of policy proposals, right? The flat tax and the universal basic income. You know, but there is something which allowed them to rule together for almost one year and which, you know, which, 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 which makes, you know, which, which they have in common, which is on the one hand, nationalism, and on the other hand, the rejection of global capitalism, okay? So, um, so the people of, Obviously, the people of the right and left populists, they are differently. Uh, let me just have a look at the time. Okay, so I, I, I hope to, to finish in, you know, three, four minutes. Okay. So the people of right and left wing populism, they are differently situated with regard to global capitalism. Okay. The first is, you know, the left, uh, the right wing populism is in competition with global capitalism. And the left wing populism, they're basically excluded from the, from the global capitalism. You know, and this explains the, dif the different policy proposals. But both, I think, are a result and a reaction against global capitalism. Okay. In fact, both the League and the Five Star Movement, they are anti-European. Huh? They have both anti-European uh, rhetoric. And then now the question of left nationalism. Now, for the left populism, the question of nationalism is, of course, a little bit delicate. Okay. And they are, of course, not outspokenly not so outspokenly nationalist as is the league or as our right-wing people. But at the end they are, because they have an idea of citizenship, right? A very thick conception of citizenship that is based upon the idea that presupposes a nation and, and forms of protectionism, right? Because, uh, because uh, they, you know, their idea of citizenship is so engaging and is actually is so demanding and 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 provides so many rights, right? That you really cannot enlarge citizenship to too many other people because you know otherwise you know the whole, the whole thing will eventually collapse. Okay. So now let me give me just a little bit more of a precise definition of populism. So so populism, according to me arises everywhere where is a group of people that gains consciousness that they are similarly situated and that they and secondly that they are equally disadvantaged with respect to particular social institutions that in this case according to me is global capitalism okay. and populism is meant to uh, defend the people against those discriminate to defend and protect the people against those discriminating discriminating social institutions so I think we can conclude from this analysis in this very brief and this is a very rough analysis of German populism that, you know, but populism is more of a desperate defense against economic forces that, that, that increasingly are out of control rather than, you know, than a nationalist identitarian project. Now, let me conclude with how effective populism might be and, and, how, and, and, how, and how to assess this, right? So, so Marx always made fun of the social democrats because he really believed that, you know, their redistributive politics and their regulation of the labor market, you know, they, they, that it's going to, to, to bring us nowhere, right? Because capitalism, they, you know, they are just smarter than that. And, and to some extent, you know, to some extent, I think, I believe that, that the developments over the last 40 years have, um, I think, have demonstrated Marx quite right on this, right? So, um, that to some extent this neoliberal course of capitalism, right, and this global course of capitalism was to some extent quite unavoidable and almost inevitable, okay. Uh, and, uh, and now the question is if populism really is an effective answer, right? I don't believe so, right? Because on the one hand, you know, left populism, you know, the welfareism of left populism, it, it doesn't change anything of the precarious position of the workers with regard to global capitalism. It just gives them, you know, just gives them hands up, gives them money, right? Which is not bad, but, uh, but eventually it, it isn't, I'm not sure how economically sustainable the, the whole thing is. And then the right populists, right? In, you know, Italy and, and the whole of Europe, it's, it's an export-oriented uh, export economy. I mean, 
nationalist protectionist policies, they turn back like a boomerang. So, so, so where, so where populism is very sweet at the beginning, right? It, it, it might turn out to be very bitter in the long run. So, what is the alternative solution that there is at, at the horizon, right? And, and you know, no, I'm not going to propose anything like Marx, Marx's solution to this, right? anything I, I believe that you know that communism i mean it's not just the, the experience of communism but but theoretically it is unsustainable and it is flawed okay but i think that marx here he had you know that the globalism of marx right it's probably can we can look at an answer there right because he really believed that you know that you know that the first step is going that you have to have an international solidarity among the workers okay and you now workers of the world unite yourselves okay so so and i think today i mean today it's it, it's time to do this and and together with uh you know together with some global regulation of capitalism as perhaps the recent proposal of Janet Yellen, you know, the treasury, um, the, the minister of the treasury in the United States to, to, to introduce a global corporate tax, you know. So, so together, you know, together with, you know, the, those institutional, global institutional responses with a more solidaric, with, with a greater solidarity among, among the workers of this world, right? This might be the answer, and and you know, and and given that, and 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 my question to you, there would be two questions, right? First, does this analysis that I just provided, from a very Italian, probably but European point of view, I believe that this holds more or less for the overall European context, at least sovereign European context plus France. Does it make sense from an Indian perspective? Could I mean, could you relate this somehow back to the Indian perspective? And second, and and secondly, you know, do you believe that you know that Indian workers? Do you, do you believe that they are ready for for something of an alliance, for something of a of of an international solidarity? You know, not just with European workers, but but you know, for for something of a global alliance. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for thank you for listening. <clears throat> um, thanks, Volker. That was very comprehensive about our book, our project, and the situation in Italy, and um, you know your. Uh, your broader concerns, which are always with liberalism, pluralism, um, and uh, with with uh, with diversity and coexistence, I think those are those are very basic concerns for for you, and especially in 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 the work you do uh, at Reset. Um, we have uh, an attendee by the name of Sanjeev Mukherjee uh, who has his hand raised. Uh, and so I'm going to allow, Sanjeev, if you're there, I'm going to allow you to speak, please. Um, if you're still there, we're going to unmute you and uh, maybe you could uh, ask your question. Alternatively, you could ask your question by typing it in the, in the Q&A box. Sanjeev Mukherjee there? Can we unmute? Okay, we have unmuted you, but we can't hear you. So anyway, in the meantime, it seems like Ajay uh, Ajay Gudavarti has uh, has something to say. So I'll let uh, I'll let Ajay go ahead. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, uh, Volker, for that uh, quite a detailed uh, and uh, glad to see that something you know, resonates between Europe and India. You know that uh, some concerns. Uh, but I would add a kind of a, a proviso to the kind of conclusion that you have drawn in terms of uh, you know, a squarely placing populism. So one is capitalism. Uh, but the question of identity, I think, still remains. The question of uh, minorities, culture, symbolism does remain. Uh, uh, do you think then we'll have to bring these two dimensions together? I mean, populism in one sense brought uh, these two dimensions of symbolic, uh, deployment of identities and uh, uh, political economy of capitalism and growing inequalities and neoliberalism together. How did that happen? And uh, what is interesting is I think it's not a well thought out process by the right itself. It looks more like what Gramsci would call conjuncturing. You know, it's like a conjuncture that kind of developed historically at a certain point in time. And this takes me back to if you're, uh, you've seen uh, Zizek's a very interesting piece on uh, multiculturalism or the a logic of uh, multinational. You know, he has a very interesting piece in the New Left Review where he uh, makes this argument about uh, multiculturalism 
uh, uh, how it kind of brings in this racism at a distance. Uh, and uh, no, he builds a very detailed argument. I, partly, I think that explains, uh, he kind of preempts, you know, if you read that piece, I think it was written sometime in late 90s, but it almost preempts a kind of a populist rise uh, in much of uh, Europe. So I think our, our real challenge today seems to be how do we bring in the cultural sociology that is purely based on imagination, psychology, uh, you know, subjectivity, uh, symbolic uh, representation, and this hard materialism of political economy, growing inequality, the kind of structural analysis we would really want to bring in. I think populism has really uh, given us an opportunity, one way to read it is to look for this, uh, uh, you know, what kind of an interface. And I don't think we really understand this, that uh, how these two processes in much of literature on populism is it's either or, you know, Nancy Fraser, uh, that kind of analysis between progressive neoliberalism, it's all very hard materialism. And then you have Cass Maday and others who are more into symbolic and identity and representation. I think some of us are ideally placed, uh, thankfully, that in terms of, you know, thinking on both fronts, and seeing that, uh, how do we, do we see it as convergence? Do we see it as a contingent uh, coming together? Because in Indian case, I can clearly tell you that the kind of anti-caste struggles, the nature of anti-hegemonic protest, themselves had something in it uh, that kind of reinforced the neoliberal uh, logic. Uh, no, Nancy, if you have seen Nancy Fraser's critique of second wave feminism, uh, she makes this uh, very interesting uh, argument about how feminism uh, critique of state and rollback of state kind of reinforce the neoliberal. I think we'll have to look at uh, you know, the secular progressive uh, left oriented critique that emerged. Uh, themselves seems to have operated in a way that has led to the rise of populism with uh, neoliberal uh, conversion. Thank you, Azai. Thank you. Um... Ms. Ananya, what, what, what I'm supposed to do, is I'm supposed to answer or, or do you want to gather other questions? Uh, actually, um, there's one other question. Uh, could you show me uh, Ayodhya, the chat window, please? Uh, you, if you want to answer that first, you can. Otherwise, Parvez Alam, who you remember from our conference, he has, uh, right. he, he has a question which is typed in the chat box. You can probably see it also. Um, in hegemony and socialist strategy, Laclau and Mouf offer radical democracy in opposition to the neoliberal hijack of democracy. This third way, uh, what Beck and Giddens offer, uh, doesn't seem to have any viability in, in a diverse society. Uh, do you think the agonism as, as, as a possibility or an alternative uh, to politicizing society uh, is, is that an option, making the politics more vibrant? He had asked about agonistic democracy yesterday as well, when mm -hmm. I when Christoph. I remember. Okay, please go ahead. Okay, that's it. Okay, now, so thank you very much, Ajay and Parvis, for those very good questions and and you know indeed um, difficult questions. Okay, so let me let me start uh, let me start. With, um, so, 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 so the point you're trying, you know, the point that you are making is, you know, we have to remain on both planes. You know, we cannot, you know, we cannot separate the plane of identity and the plane of political economy as as it is usually done, right? So, so in a conference like this, obviously the the the, the cultural religious identity plane is prevailing, and he would go, you know, it would go to. To conferences of social scientists, you know, are, are of economists probably the, the political economical uh, aspects would prevail. And and what you what you're suggesting is what we need an integration, right? So a little bit like what and, and you quote also Nancy Fraser here, you know, and you know a little bit like the, the exchange that there was between Axel Hanet and 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 Nancy Fraser, you know, about redistribution or recognition, right? That you have that you have those 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 two aspects now. Now, to some extent, I agree, and I, I, to some, well, I, I, as a matter of fact, I would agree here, okay, and, but, but I would also try and try to point out that, that it's very complicated, you know, it's, it's, it's very complicated to, to keep those two dimensions, theoretically, I mean, would, I mean, philosophically, conceptually together, right, because, uh, because, you know, if you, at the moment, 
at the moment that you accept something of an identitarian point of view, so that you accept something like cultural, religious, like national identities, right? That you, that you, that you grant that collective identities are contrary to what most of post-colonial and post-modern literature uh, says. That that identities are are there. That they're quite real. I mean, that they're not, you know, um, you know, that they are not just. Um, they're not just an illusion, right? That there is that there is something real to them, right? So if you take that point of view, right? Now you can obviously then say and say, okay, of course, you know, we have a social scientific analysis, and we're going to see, you know, that you know the reality of those collective identities is given by a, by a certain cause by social institutions, which we then can identify, right? But at the moment that you really accept the idea that there are identities, you immediately confront the question that those identities at some point become quite autonomous from whatever cause there might be, there might underlie, okay? And that suddenly you, 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 you know, once, once you have the identitarian discourse there, once you have the question of identity there, it is so hard not to take people seriously when they say, well, I do this in the name of God, I do this in the name of, of, of Hindu, I do this in the name of, of, of whatever, okay, of, of my religion, of my nation, and, and so forth, right? You have the problem that, that once you accept identity, that you immediately slip into a normative discourse, right? Into a more normative moral discourse. And, and and once you're in that, you know, you, you know, you are there where, where liberals are, you know, you try to, to reason with them about identity, what is identity and what it is not, and, and you just completely forget about, about what is underlying there, you know, probably institutions which after all are deeply unjust, unequal, and 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 you know, which which make people get out of, get out of their mind, you know, and 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 and, and look there, then for an anchor, which, which probably is the nation, religion, and, 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 and the group identity and so forth, right? So I and you know and and as I I have to say I, I really don't know an answer to this right because because I, I I you know I'm stuck you know I'm stuck exactly with that question there to say okay like look look I I I, I would you know I'm so happy to go along with an institutionalist uh, approach because I really believe and and you know and and my analysis of of Italian populism was meant to show you know that. You know that, that there is nothing like one nation. You know that the nation is some. There are different social classes which compete for different, for influence over different institutions and so forth. So, so I really believe I really believe in the institutionalist approach, but at the moment that I take, you know, that I believe that identity is not just you know an illusion. You know that identity is there. I I I I, I really don't have an answer yet. How. I mean, how, how, how then to address that question, other than perhaps the liberals do, right? You know, that they engage in a discussion about reasonableness and reasonable forth, right? So that, that, that would be my, that would be my, my answer to you, Ajay. And, and then my answer to you, Parvas, is, you know, uh, you know, I, I, you know, as I said, I go along with, with Laclau and the way he sets up the question of populism and, and his definition of populism. But, you know, I, I, I do not go along with, with the left populist proposal. You know, I, 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 um, I know for, for reasons, no, I, I, you know, I, I don't endorse the left populist stance, okay. Um, and the reason is, you know, that I believe that even if they, you know, they, 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 they are deep down constructionists, you know, because, you know, the people of, of Laclau, obviously, it's a very heterogeneous, uh, uh, they're very heterogeneous, I mean, if the people, the people of Laclau are very heterogeneous, as I said, you know, you have, Laclau would even include the immigrants, they, he would include, um, you know, the feminist discourse, he would include, you know, the workers discourse, he would, everyone who has a social claim would be included in La Clare. But even, you know, even if he, you know, even if he uh, you now insists that his people are constructed, right, they're not given, right, that they are not like the people of, 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 of the right populists. I believe that deep down, deep down, it comes, it, it, it comes down to, 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 to the same nationalist and protectionist discourse, you know. And, 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 I, and, and as I say, that nationalist and protectionist discourse 
according to me, is one which in the long run is really going to fail, right? Which, you know, which perhaps is going to give you some short-term gains, but, but really in the long run is, is, is going to be dramatically failed. And, and to which I believe you have to really have a globalist answer, right? And therefore I, you know, I, 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 I quoted, I, I, I quoted the work of Marx on, on, on the workers, on the international workers' solidarity now. now and if you ask me now, if, how this is going to be, right? If it is going to be, because your question was not exactly on, you know, how, if I would endorse left populism, but your question was, you know, if I would endorse some form of agnostic democracy, which then would be uh, <clears throat> very much related to the work of Chantal Mouffe. Um, um, right, I, uh, right, probably I would endorse it to the extent that it, you know, enables and allows institutions to move on a little bit quicker, right? So if you really have protest groups and, and, and protest movements, right, over the world, right, which, you know, which probably we had with the wall, uh, um, what was the name of it? No, I forget it. But I mean, over the last, over the last, um, over the last 10 years, I mean, we had a global movement of, of a global protest movement, right? So I, I believe in that sense, you know, if you have those protest movements, you know, who who demonstrate and 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 demonstrate their, their grievances, their unhappiness, and their resentment, and you know, and 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 try to push institutions to move on quicker. You know, like for example, I mean, the question that Janet Yellen was proposing something of a corporate global global tax. I mean, this is unheard of two years ago, and and it is of course a result. You know, it is of course a result of five years of Trump, right? So, so in that sense, you know, uh, an, an antagonistic point of view uh, can be very helpful, but eventually I would believe that, you know, what we really have to think about and what we really have to come to terms is, is what just institutions are, okay, and how actually a just redistribution and how actually a just economic system does look like. So, so I don't believe that as Mouffe and, and, and Laclau that, that, that the final word is an agonist democracy, okay, antagonist democracy. I believe that the last word is that we have to figure out what it is a just social institution. Okay, Falker, we had, uh, you know, we had an early hand raiser, but that person, uh, we, we're not able to connect to them. I don't know what happened. So I think we'll call this to a close. Uh, we've, uh, you know, we've spent really the better part of two days uh, uh, on this very rich discussion. Um, thank you so much, Falker, for, for uh, joining in despite the time difference and the fact that you're teaching and the fact that you're also probably working from home. Um, and I was telling everyone yesterday that, uh, you know, if this had been normal times, then we would have hosted probably, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, 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 a more extensive, more participatory kind of a, a book uh, discussion, um, uh, maybe in person, uh, but, but uh, alas, this is the best that one can do at the moment. Um, I'm very, very uh, grateful to to all the um, all the participants, all the panelists, all the speakers, uh, all the editors and writers of the different volumes and the contributors. Um, um, we've we've uh, I think you know given given our extreme constraints in in every possible sense. I think we've. We've really managed to to have a very rich discussion, and uh, this uh, both you know all the videos of this this event will will are already on Facebook, uh, on the CSDS page, uh, and will remain there. And probably some some edited version or clips etc. will also go on the CSDS website, though that may take some time. Uh, so so people who are unable to join now could could join in later and, and follow whatever you know part of it makes sense to them. Um, but thank you uh, again, um, all our uh, speakers, panelists, attendees, uh, audience, um, enthusiasts uh, of this uh, you know of this range of very important subjects that are troubling and disturbing our world. Um, and uh, I hope that we can, 
continue our conversations uh, on and offline in person and remotely um if uh, anybody would like uh, you know any kind of further uh, uh discussion uh, you have more queries you should please feel free to email me um uh, you can find find me on the csds website um and otherwise uh, we will take your leave now um folks it's nice to see you um and thank you for wrapping everything up so uh, so cogently um and uh, goodbye friends and uh, till next time thank you